at the mercy of the Marquise. Written by Fanny Finch and published by Starfall Publications. Subscribe for more audiobooks. Enjoy. Chapter 1 The Duchess of Dorset's School for Noble Women was a terrifying building, a face of solid grey brick looming over the dull fields like a giant surveying his domain. It was clear that some sort of an effort had been made to make it appear more inviting, with the addition of beautiful flowers in the gardens and a stunningly bright paint applied to the window frames, doors and outer gate. But despite all this, it still maintained an austere air about it, as though warning any who approached that it was, above all, a place for study and self-improvement. For the four young women facing the building, this would be a wholly new experience. All came from privileged backgrounds. All had known nothing but wealth and comfort their whole lives. All had been plunged into desperation suddenly, with only the School for Noble Women extending them anything resembling a helping hand. Leah Drew did not feel comfortable, but she put on a brave face. This was her fate now, after all. Her mousy brown hair tied back sharply, her heavy travelling cloak concealing her small frame, and her hand weakly gripping a heavy item of luggage. It was hard for her not to notice how different her life had become. But there was nothing she could do to change it. And besides, one of the four girls had to be the responsible one. Agnes was stern, but out of touch with reality. Talia was far too optimistic, and Julie had not much life experience to speak of. It was up to Leah to remain calm and make sure that all of them pulled through this horrible change in their circumstances. Agnes Hubbard looked furious. She had looked furious ever since the bad news had reached the four girls. Unlike the others, Agnes still had living relatives with power and wealth. They simply wanted nothing to do with her. She still wore her sleek black hair as she did when she was wealthy and refused to part with any of. Her gowns or jewels, insisting that she would soon return to her former wealth. For Agnes, having to go to a school to become a governess was an insult. Talia Smith and Julie Lilly, the youngest of the four, were gripping one another's hands firmly as they looked up in awe at the imposing building. Talia was determined to do well, but she was also clearly terrified. She was one of the few who had very little left in life. No more relatives, no other friends besides the ones by her side, no money to her name after it was all lost. However scared she was, she made every effort to see this as a positive, an opportunity to embrace, and never hesitated to remind the others of how lucky they all were to have something to work towards. Even so, she seemed uncertain, her soft brown eyes wide, her lips pursed with apprehension as she squeezed Julie's hand in an effort to comfort her dear friend. Julie Lilly wasn't even supposed to be there. She had only packed at the last minute and seemed apprehensive as she looked up at the school. She had thought she would be fine. After all, her father was a knight and a successful entrepreneur, and her mother, despite her humble background, was tolerated by Sir Lilly's peers. Although it was only the two of them left, Julie had been confident there would be more than enough wealth to support them until she could find a decent husband. Something had changed. Julie had not intimated to the other girls just what the extent of her situation was, but all they knew was that she did not have as much money from her father as she had expected, and now she would be studying to become a governess as well. As a couple of servants descended from the school to help them with their excess luggage, the young women looked to one another feeling no small amount of shame. Only a few short weeks ago, each of them would go everywhere accompanied by a servant who would take charge of such things. Now they were dropped off unceremoniously by a coach and even had to transport much of their own luggage indoors, as the school they would be attending did not have enough servants to dedicate five or six to transporting their luggage. Inside, the building was just as austere, with plain walls and floors for the most part. Leah was not sure she was prepared for this at all. She felt like crying. But she had to be strong. Not just for herself, but for the other three, who also looked on the verge of tears. As they glanced towards her, she smiled softly, reassuringly, and followed the queue of the servants, placing her bags at the foot of the stairs to be carried up to their quarters. Miss Drew, 
Miss Hubbard, Miss Smith, Miss Lily, one of the servants said, as though completing a roll call at a school for children, rather than addressing educated ladies at a school for governesses. Please do come through. Her Grace would like to finally see you all. After the vastness of the façade and the starkness of the entrance, the drawing room was a welcome relief. This was more familiar. Carpeted floors, paintings hanging from the walls, and a stunning sculpture in the corner. A life-sized model of a man holding the head of an enormous serpent. This was more to the women's tastes, and they were very much relieved when an older woman in a stern, slightly old-fashioned, but nonetheless expensive and fine deep blue dress, waved them over. They made their way before her chair, and each curtsied deeply in turn before following the wave of the Duchess's hand and taking a seat, in a sort of synchronised ritual that felt so very peculiar, and yet so perfectly normal. Once they were all seated, they waited with bated breath for their benefactor to talk. Welcome, girls, the Duchess said, her voice smooth as silk, with a rich, cultured accent. Despite the misfortune of your circumstances, let it be known that I am nevertheless pleased to be in the company of such fine young ladies, and to count women of such excellent backgrounds among my students. Please tell me what you aim to achieve in completing a course at my school for noble women. Agnes nodded sharply. Your Grace, our aim is to avoid further misfortune and to ensure that other young ladies are raised with the same graces that we were endowed with. The Duchess seemed pleased with that response. The other three girls knew better than to interrupt Agnes, who was the only one of them who truly understood the nuances of talking with someone of the Duchess's standing. I am afraid that I cannot treat you any differently, the Duchess remarked. Although you are young ladies of a very fine background, my clients are incredibly demanding and only want the best for their daughters. I hope that you understand you shall be expected to complete your education as every other student does. As though connected, the girls nodded in unison before casting glances to one another out of the corners of their eyes. That being said, the Duchess continued, you shall not be expected to share quarters with girls of a more humble background, nor shall you be expected to begin at the lowest level of etiquette training and literary education. Instead, unless proven otherwise, I shall assume that you are educated, fine young ladies who simply require some lessons as to how to pass these skills on to young girls. From the corner of her eye, Leah could tell that Agnes was still not happy with the situation. And yet Julie and Talia seemed very much wary, obviously worrying that their own education may be insufficient and they might be sent back for lessons on basic etiquette. Leah was just grateful for the opportunity to lead a decent life once again. She didn't want or need to be treated as a noblewoman. After the Duchess explained to them where the etiquette classes would be held and what they were expected to learn of literature, French, German and music, they were dismissed and shown to what would be their quarters. The room contained five beds, but they were to be the only residents. Sitting on the beds, observing their as of yet still packed luggage, the young women silently contemplated their circumstances. I do not like it here, Agnes said finally, absent-mindedly swinging her feet a little off the edge of the bed and staring at the embroidery roses hanging on the wall opposite. Talia shook her head. None of us do. But it is not as though we had a choice. We must endeavour to see the bright side of the situation. But, and do forgive me for saying so, I am not like you, Agnes replied. I had people who ought to have taken me in. People who at one time loved me and showed me respect. Friends, family and father's business partners. And what of them now, pray tell? As soon as I am weak, they cast a dagger into my back. Talia scowled a little. Agnes, you must not see it that way. What purpose does vindictiveness serve? What good is there in harbouring a grudge? I know that it does no good, but neither does weeping when in pain. I cannot help but be angry, Agnes explained. We must carry ourselves with dignity and grace, Leah insisted, and we must accept what fate casts our way. Agnes sighed. It must be so easy to say such things when one has no choices. But fortunately, I at least have my aunt left. 
She resides in France, and her letter shall take some time to arrive. But she has always been kind to me, and I would hope that she should extend a caring hand my way. For that matter, Julie, dear, you have not yet explained what happened to cause you to end up here. Is your mother not alive still? Did you not inherit your father's lands? And such a successful man at that. After a few seconds of blankly staring at Agnes, lip quivering as she tried to hold back her tears, Julie lay down on her bed, face first, and began to weep. It was far too much for the young woman, barely out of girlhood, to have her life turned so cruelly upside down. It seemed as though there was more to her situation than any of them knew. Leah had not expected to see Julie at Talia's house when they rendezvoused to wait for the coach. But there she had been, shrinking away from the other two young women, clinging to Talia's hand, looking pale and afraid. Something was wrong, especially considering her mother was not by her side. But besides the fact that she was indeed to attend the Duchess of Dorset's school for noble women, Julie would not discuss her circumstances. Yet just because she did not know the cause of Julie's pain did not mean Leah could not empathise with it. Leah sat beside Julie, gently petting her shoulder and back until the sobs subsided. The room was weighed down by an uncomfortable silence. As Julie sat up, face flushed and damp, Talia moved in and sat to her other side. Julie buried her face in Talia's shoulder and whimpered a little. I am so sorry. Agnes said, her expression contorted with distress. I did not mean to insult you, Julie. Julie looked up and shook her head. It is simply too much for me to bear. It is not your fault that I am far too sensitive for my own good, Agnes. Agnes looked as though she did not know what to reply. She looked ashamed of herself, but already having Julie's forgiveness, her pride would not allow her to apologise further. Talia looked out the window, still embracing Julie, and smiled softly. But how wonderful it is that we live in a day and age where such opportunities are available to us. How fortunate we are to have enjoyed an education that allows us to enter such a prestigious institution and make a better life for ourselves. Were we born in another time, or another place, or to other families, we would surely be wholly destitute by now. Nevertheless, we persevere, and we shall succeed before long. Chapter 2 Had Leah, or any of the girls for that matter, been told three weeks ago that in less than a month she would be relying on charity, she would have thought it some sort of joke. After all, all of them were somewhat sheltered, surrounded by loving family and friends, and wealthy beyond the average person's wildest imagination. For most of their lives, the greatest extent of the girls' worries had been what dress to wear, whether or not they were allowed to stay up to attend a ball or gala, or how long a fake cough could delay their dreaded music lessons for. As they became young women, their concerns solidified into finding respectable husbands, so that they could continue their lives as decent young women. None had any older brothers or sisters, so as their friends married and departed, or relaxed knowing they were relatively free the four girls found their days completely occupied by the seriousness of their task. In the midst of all that, their fathers joined forces and arranged a massive shipment of ivory and gold across the coast of West Africa, in part to ensure their daughters had a hefty dowry to help them ease into their new married lives. Nobody had expected the trade to go anything but swimmingly. All their fathers had been intrepid adventurers and businessmen. The girls had barely noticed when they departed other than to wish them well. And what reason had they to suspect something would go wrong? Their fathers had gone on two business ventures together previously, to China and to Peru, and had been very successful. Each man brought something to the table which contributed to their success. Leah's family had always been of some status, not much, but knights by inheritance, which was a nice way into high society. They had just enough connection to the upper classes to secure good trade deals, but they were not so wealthy or powerful as to be ashamed of working. Her father's work had not brought them great wealth, but had allowed them to maintain the same standard of living through the years, which was good enough for Leah. Leah and Julie had always been dear friends. Neither having any siblings, 
and Leah being a maternal girl without a mother or a sister, and Julie needing a mentor, it seemed perfect. Julie's father was another knight, and besides her mother, she had nobody else. Unlike Leah's father, Julie's father had earned his title through duties performed for the crown in India, and was highly respected. Julie's mother came from a humble background, but was fairly tolerated in their social circles on account of her wealth and social influence. Leah always found it odd to consider that she, a girl whose mother had passed away in labour, was considered to be better educated in matters of grace and femininity than Julie, who had a mother to instruct her, but was struck by the misfortune of having a mother of a lower background. But neither of them had held a candle to Agnes in terms of class, elegance and femininity. Leah had met Agnes in the last few years. Agnes's family were incredibly important people, comprising nothing less than barons and lords. Nobody had worked in her family for generations. Her father himself was Earl of Kent. And that was how they had met. The Earl had led a sheltered, quiet life, but longed for a few experiences of adventure. He had funded some journeys already, but none of his beneficiaries had agreed to take him with them. Lord Drew and Sir Lily had been an exception. They got along well with the Earl and agreed wholeheartedly to bring him with them on their journeys. In travelling together, the three had grown close, despite the class boundaries between them. Agnes's mother was conspicuously absent and never spoken of. Talia was the most recent addition to the group. Her father's cooperation with the Earl of Kent, Sir Lily and Lord Drew was his first venture. He had received a hefty inheritance when his father passed away, but being a baron he had never traded before, living wholly off his lands. He did not need the money, but was devoted to charitable causes, and thought it would be wise to invest his inheritance, multiply it, and so give more to a worthy cause. Although at first the other men had thought him a little soft of heart and mind, and a little eccentric, they warmed up to him as they bonded over the struggles of raising a single young lady. All four fathers had faced their own challenges, and all, for some reason or another, were left with only one child, a daughter, to raise into a proper lady. Although their fathers had their ups and downs, the girls had got along famously from the start. All four shared the pains of being raised largely or wholly by their fathers, as well as the burdens of being the only child to make their family proud. Both experiences were completely unimaginable to the other young women and girls living in the area. Even the poorest and lowest class local girls had a mother, or a loving aunt or grandmother at home. And across all classes most had one or more siblings, or other children sharing their home. This unique bond, combined with living so close to one another, meant they were welcome in one another's homes. And whilst their fathers were away, they would go to each other's houses whenever they received a letter from their father to read it aloud to their friends, making sure that everyone knew all was well. This time was no different. It was not only a relief to hear news of their fathers, but also a bonding experience for the girls, providing them with an excuse to leave the seclusion of their homes and have tea with one another. But then one day the letters did not arrive. Leah tried to remain optimistic. After all, there had been reports of a storm. Perhaps their fathers had not been able to stop at a port to post their letters. Or perhaps the mail ship had been delayed or even lost. But news of the storm passed, and letters began arriving from abroad again, and still there was no news from their fathers or their ship. After another week, there were regular prayers for them at church. Every single day the pastor had something to say for the missing men and their abandoned daughters left at home with only female friends of the family and senior servants to care for them. All knew what had happened long before the official news reached them, but even then, the girls could not believe it. It was just too much to bear. Their fathers had been the only people who had always been there for them, who had always cared for them and loved them. And now they were gone. The one constant in their lives, the one thing they could count on, was gone. And like a building that had lost its supporting wall, the whole of their lives came toppling down around them. All four had reacted quite differently, and all four had sought solace in one another. They understood that although the town and their peers showed them some sympathy, only their friends truly understood their situation. 
Only someone who was also going through it could provide true comfort. Agnes had at first run to the few people she thought she could count on, and had been enraged when her family turned their backs on her. Leah did not know the full extent of the situation, but from what she could gather, Agnes had reached out to relatives and friends of the family only to be rejected. It was something to do with Agnes's mother, but Agnes would reveal no more. After exhausting most of her possible sources of security, Agnes had surrendered and dedicated herself to finding a safe place for the girls to live together. The Duchess of Dorset's invitation was more than welcome. Talia had nobody else at all. Her mother had passed away a few years before she moved with her father, and the rest of her family had been claimed by some terrible fever a decade before that. The house she lived in was rented, and her father had not left enough detail of his accounts for her to locate an inheritance, if there was any inheritance to be had. Without her father, and without a single connection in the area, she was scared she would be doomed to living the life of a spinster in whatever run-down cottage she could afford. She was the only one who embraced her new fate, knowing that things would not get any better for her. She was immensely grateful for her friend's company. Only Julie seemed to have escaped the trials of this wicked twist of fate. But in the last minute, she joined them. They had been told that she and her mother would be moving to London and living in her father's apartment there. They would sell the manor they currently inhabited and lead a modest life until they knew what their situation would be like and Julie would set herself about meeting and marrying a fine young man who would once again elevate both women into more respectable society. The other girls knew that Julie's mother had been a simple nurse when Sir Lily fell in love with her, but Julie had assured them that neither she nor her mother would need to work, and that they need not worry about her welfare. What change in circumstances, then, had befallen her in the last minute? And what of Lady Lily? Where was she now? None of the others knew. Leah was glad that the four of them could remain together, but she was also distressed at how cruel fate had been. All four of them had been good young ladies, all four had sought to please their peers, and all four were on the cusp of womanhood, ready to begin courting and perhaps to wed. Had this taken place a few years earlier, they would still have been girls, and someone would have taken pity on them. Had it taken place a few years later, they would have been married and living with their husbands. But it had taken place only a couple of weeks ago, and they were at the Duchess of Dorset School for Noble Women. Looking out the window, Leah was surprised to see a young man wandering the gardens. How was he there, in a school for young ladies? All of the attending students were girls and young women, as were the teachers, and the benefactress herself. Only a couple of the servants were men namely the coach drivers and the doormen, and all of them were older men, wed to the maids and housekeepers who bustled about the school. It was so odd to see a young, well-dressed, shapely male figure on the grounds. Who, pray tell, is that? Talia gasped, following Leah's eyes and gawking most indecently at the well-built young man in his gleaming coat. I do not know, Leah said. To be quite honest, it perturbs me that there is a young man here at all. Ought he to be here? Oh, the Duchess has a son, Agnes remarked, as though it was something she had meant to say but had simply forgotten. He is not yet wed, but his parents do not trust him, so he is always to live with them. That is the Duchess's son, Talia said. He is so young. Agnes nodded. He is. She has three older daughters but it seems that his grace was determined to have an heir, so he is their youngest child, but their eldest and only son. And unwed, you say? Talia remarked with a blush. Chapter 3 Walking in the gardens, Leah felt refreshed and relaxed. This was precisely what she needed to put her mind at ease. After unpacking their bags and having their first introductions to the wonderful ladies who would be their tutors, Leah had expected to feel even calmer than before. Much to her surprise, it was Talia and Julie's restless minds that were put at ease, and her own that was cast into turmoil. The reality of the situation struck her harder than before, as one tutor discussed the matter of caring for infants. The thought that she might spend her entire life looking after someone else's child, and possibly never have one of her own, 
was more than she could bear. But the gardens helped soothe her and reassured her that all that would pass was part of God's plan. Seeing the bright flowers and the bees bumbling from one to the next, she felt more a part of the universe than ever, and she knew that whatever twists or turns life would hand her, it would be her fate, and it would be good. She was so distracted by these thoughts that she very nearly walked into someone. It was him again, the Duchess's son. Up close, he was even more handsome than Leah had begun to imagine. His sleek, dark brown hair was straight and well-groomed, and his soft blue eyes were friendly, yet full of mischief. He raised his eyebrows at her and smiled. Good day, miss. I have not yet made your acquaintance, he said, his voice low and rumbling. She curtsied deeply, stammered an apology, and made her way back towards the school. It was too much. How could she be expected to focus with such a handsome man wandering around? It was only as she walked in through the door that she realised she ought to have told him her name. She couldn't even do that right. He was simply too distracting for even simple social interactions. Catching her breath, Leah realised she was not alone in the hall. Also there, peering out the window, subtly spying on the young man, was Talia, lips slightly parted, eyes wide. She turned to face Leah and smiled. Is he not a rum duke? Talia said with slight excitement in her voice. I have not seen such a handsome man in all my life. Oh, but he is so much more handsome from here. Tell me, what is he like up close? He must be the very picture of Adam in the Garden of Eden. The perfect man, the blueprint that all were made from. And much like Adam, he is fallen and humbled just like us, Leah replied. And unlike Eve, we must make every effort to resist such primitive temptations and to devote our minds to higher things. If only we had never fallen, and in Eden I could devote myself to him, Talia said with a sigh. But we must maintain our decorum, Leah insisted with a sharp nod, and we must show him, and ourselves, some respect. Talia pursed her lips but nodded. It is so easy to forget oneself when faced with something so perfect, though, she remarked. Perhaps that is the trouble. Leah replied, taking Talia's hand and beginning to guide her from the window. He is not perfect. He is an ordinary human being. And if you observe him from afar, it may perhaps be easy to consider him wonderful in every way. But upon closer inspection you might see he is not quite so perfect after all. Talia nodded. But I have not yet had such a close inspection, she replied as they walked into their quarters. They both halted upon seeing Agnes seated at the desk, writing out her first lesson in neat curls of black ink. I do not know how anyone manages to remain calm and focus on her training with a man wandering about, Talia said. What is that? Agnes asked, looking up. You both ought to learn a lesson from me and write down all you have learned. It will help you to better recollect it, and even should you not, you will have the notes from which to learn it again. I was simply saying that you are right there by the window, doing your work rather than admiring the beauty of our benefactor, Talia remarked, and I do not mean the Duchess by that. Agnes laughed. He is a fool, that is well known in all proper circles. He may be handsome and well-connected, but that is all. Talia wrinkled her nose a little. Well, none of us is perfect, and I am sure no amount of foolishness would diminish him. Be careful not to sell yourself a dream, Talia, Agnes replied. Even if he turned out to be an excellent young man, that is no guarantee he would consider you when seeking a wife, and vice versa. Talia blushed and giggled. Am I so transparent? Clear as water, Agnes said, returning to her desk. And so is he. Trust me when I say you ought not waste your time on such a foolish young man. Leah was not convinced. She hadn't spoken to the young man but he appeared perfectly decent to her. Or perhaps anyone would look decent to a woman in her situation. Perhaps her own desperation was clouding her judgment. After all, to marry the heir to a duchy would rescue her from her dire circumstances and elevate her even higher than she once was, placing her at the true heights of society. And what young woman would not wish for that? This thought made Leah cautious. 
although there was no possibility of her ever marrying a man such as the Duchess's son, she knew now to maintain her guard around all eligible young men, and not to make a rash decision as to her future marriage prospects. Just as she was about to sit down and do as Agnes suggested, and make notes of her lessons, the door opened. A maid walked in, head held aloft. Her Grace the Duchess of Dorset, the maid announced before stepping aside, revealing their benefactress in all her glory. Agnes and Leah sprung to their feet, and all three girls curtsied deeply. The Duchess smiled and nodded. I simply wish to invite all four of you to sup with me tonight, as a special welcome meal. Agnes curtsied again. Of course, Your Grace, she replied. I see you met my son, the Marquis of Salisbury, the Duchess remarked, making eye contact with Leah as she left. I trust you treated him with the respect that he is due. She was gone before Leah could say anything. Leah felt a little surprised. The young man had not struck her as someone old enough to possess a title. Although he was the son of a duke, his father was most decidedly alive and well, so he could not have inherited the title from anyone. She made her way back to the edge of her bed, where she sat down and resumed her efforts at writing down her daily lesson. How is he a marquis? Leah said suddenly, still baffled. Agnes looked up from the desk and over her shoulder, slightly bothered at being interrupted yet again. Pardon? The Duchess's son is too young to be a marquis, Leah replied. He isn't really the marquis, Agnes explained. That's his father's title, but he is allowed to bear it until he has one of his own. Leah paused. She was not exactly of a lowly birth, and yet she had never encountered such a ridiculous idea. I believe I understand. Agnes cast Leah a glance that let Leah know Agnes was entirely aware of how clueless Leah was before turning about in her chair and resuming her work. Agnes was not the sort of lady who reveled in drama and gossip wherever she found it. If Leah said she understood, then far be it from Agnes to correct her. Talia, who had been looking out the window instead of making her own notes, shrugged a little. Does it matter terribly whence his title came from? Leah shook her head. I just think it's wrong that a man should be permitted to carry a title he has not earned. I understand that, but he would carry his father's titles either way, in a few years at least, Talia explained. No, then. But then his father would have offered him the opportunity to earn those titles, and he would have proven himself worthy, would he not? Leah asked. Perhaps his father already considers him worthy of the title of Marquis, Talia suggested. Otherwise, why would he bear it? Leah pursed her lips. Perhaps he is spoiled and insists on having a title. We must consider all possibilities. Talia just shrugged. He is very handsome, and we know nothing else of him. I do not believe he is spoiled just because of a title. Leah was about to agree when a slight cough from Agnes reminded them that they were not alone in the room, and that at least one person was making an effort towards her studies. Leah was not used to this. Although she had attended classes often, she had never really felt a passion for them. Agnes, on the other hand, had always been studying some subject or another at her father's behest, and took to it like a fish to water. And Talia had been doted upon by her father, never once expected to do anything that would upset her, which included being forced to study. So as Agnes worked hard and Talia got lost watching the birds fly outside the window, Leah attempted to focus over the sound of her own thoughts. But it was all but impossible. The Marquis was lingering on her mind. Leah wasn't sure why, but she found herself looking forward to seeing the Marquis at dinner that evening. Perhaps it was just the novelty. It had been so long since she had even dreamed of having a nice dinner again, with a member of high society and such a charming young gentleman. Of course it was possible that the Marquis would not be present, but the Duchess's remark had suggested that he might be, and that was good enough for Leah to consider him when choosing her clothes for the evening. She made sure to put on her neatest dress and to tie her hair back with some fine cream ribbons that stood out against her brown tresses. She knew she needed to look elegant and feminine, but her situation also demanded she be modest and dress simply. It was a difficult balance, 
showing her graces and former status whilst acknowledging the humility her circumstances demanded. And although she did not want to get too carried away by the thought of spending time in the presence of the Marquis, she also knew that the Duchess's presence herself would be more than enough excuse to make an effort. After all, their benefactress was an elegant, proper, feminine, yet austere and godly woman. She embodied all that the girls had been raised to admire. The least Leah could do was show she understood the Duchess's power. Dinner with a Duchess. That was something which Leah was sure the other students did not receive. The four girls were old enough and sophisticated enough to earn such a privilege, even at the depths of their darkest hours. At least however bad things got, Leah knew she would always be treated with the dignity a noblewoman deserved. This gave her some hope for the future. After her father's death, she had expected to lose all her status. But it seemed that some echo of her heritage still enveloped her, making sure she came to no harm. Chapter 4 The dining table was laid beautifully, just as the girls remembered from dinner parties back home. Julie seemed almost brought to tears as she took her seat. Talia and Leah cast one another excited glances, and Agnes, although maintaining her composure, had a thankful glimmer in her eyes. Almost as soon as they were seated, the Duchess and the Marquis were announced, and the young women immediately stood up as their hosts entered the room. Her grace was as elegant as always, in her older, understated yet still sumptuous gown. The Marquis of Salisbury looked even more handsome than he had back in the gardens. Although it was a modest dinner with some new students, he was impeccable, hair combed back sharply, clothes following formal evening dress code, a subtle smile on his lips, as though he knew that although this was his mother's school, his mother's charity, and his mother's dinner, he was lord of all he surveyed. He had the elegance, arrogance, and general way of carrying himself of an overproud tomcat. Making eye contact with Leah, he strode up to the chair by her side and found his seat just as his mother took her place at the head of the table. Once their benefactors were seated, the Duchess waved her hand and the girls sat back down, all somewhat flustered at the presence of such a handsome young man. "'You seem like a true young lady,' the Marquis remarked with a smile, watching Leah intently, as though trying to catch her blushing. Leah nodded sharply. Thank you kindly, my lord. And yet you were so shy in the gardens, he added. Are you none too sure of yourself? Not at all, my lord, Leah replied. I was simply surprised to see a young man at a school for ladies. You do have a bit of an accent, if you do not mind my saying so, the Marquis remarked. A bit southwesterly? Leah averted her gaze. She had always been somewhat uncomfortable about her accent. Yes, that is where my father hailed from. And a lovely accent too, if properly trained, the Marquis remarked. Leah was not sure how to react to this. She simply smiled and tolerated a compliment that was given with one hand and robbed back with the other. Perhaps you would need some lessons in enunciation, he insisted. I am sure with a few classes you will be all the more a lady. Leah is very much a lady, my lord. Agnes replied, as I am sure you are aware. Of course, of course, the Marquis replied, but grace is as grace does, and do you not think that grace ought to present itself with a little more finery? He turned to his mother, who seemed to be contemplating the situation. Leah tried to bite back her anger at the insult. Did he think she would not notice? Did he take her for a fool? She was not sure what game he was playing with her but she would not stoop so low as to respond to it. She was, after all, a lady, regardless of what he said about her accent. I am sure it is a bit of a shock for you to be here, the Marquis commented to Agnes. A young lady of your bloodline is scarcely prepared for hard work. Leah could tell that Agnes was now as angry with him as Leah herself was. Julie also appeared somewhat indignant. I do not know how Agnes shall fit in, but I trust she will persevere until she does, Julie said flatly. I believe you will all fit in perfectly, do not worry, he said, still smiling. It was as though he loved seeing them uncomfortable. And his mother simply watched on. 
She did not seem as entertained by his antics as he was, but she did not seem insulted by them either. An air of serenity perpetually surrounded her, masking her true emotions. Leah could not help but wonder how it must feel to have a son like the Marquis, an arrogant, childish young man who took great pleasure in teasing young ladies, who carried a title he had not earned, and who still depended on his parents for support at an age where most young men were marrying. Leah felt somewhat sorry for the Duchess, who herself was a wonderful woman, carrying herself with the utmost dignity. Besides the poor company, the meal was excellent, just like back home. The servants catered to the girls' every need, and they ate a selection of meats and delightful breads and jellies, the likes of which they had missed out on for the last month. It was a welcome change, and even if they would not feast like this often, simply having one last chance to savour the delicacies they were raised on was wonderful. The Marquis's rudeness was soon forgotten in pleasant conversation between the girls, with the Duchess overseeing and occasionally interjecting. But by the time the dessert arrived, he was attempting to make his presence known again. I am not sure that Miss Hubbard requires a dessert, he said with a smirk. But perhaps Miss Smith would like a second one. I am sure that my lord does not mean to be so harsh, Leah said, offering him a way to ingratiate himself to them again. Surely he could not truly wish to hurt the girl's feelings. I mean what I say and I say what I think, he replied. I do not believe anyone present takes any issue with that. Besides, I do believe it shall help you all to improve yourselves if you listen to my critiques, such as the enunciation classes I have kindly offered you. Leah gritted her teeth a little. Well, she most certainly took issue with all of this, but she had to remember the benevolence of the Duchess and strive to forget her son's awful behaviour. Still, she had never met such rudeness before. Glancing towards Agnes, it was clear this was not normal for even a man in the Marquis's position. Agnes's face was red with a combination of shame and anger. Although she defiantly ate and relished her slice of cake, it was clear to her friends that the Marquis's comments had cut her deeply, and she did not feel comfortable with a single bite of it. Returning to their quarters for the night, Leah shook her head and sighed. I had not expected that the most difficult aspect of this would be enduring the host. I told you he was an unseemly young man, Agnes said flatly. He looks the part, but there is something wrong with him. I am not sure if he could be considered mentally defective, however morally and spiritually he most certainly is. Talia nodded. I am glad you warned me not to grow too close to a man I do not know, Leah, for to become attached to such a wicked man would be awful. Leah took Talia's hand and squeezed it gently as they walked. He meant to insult you. There is nothing wrong with your figure or with Agnes. You are both beautiful and unique as God made you. And there is nothing wrong with your accent, Talia said with a smile. It is lovely. I find it incredible that someone in his position would abuse his power like that, Julie said with a slight sniff. Has he no concerns for our feelings? Agnes chuckled a little. But Julie, he did not say anything at all to you. Julie sniffed again. I know, but he paid my friends such great insults. I wish I were as witty and confident as all of you, that I might respond to his wicked words. It is better that you did not speak, Agnes replied, her voice slowly returning to calm. He is seeking a response from us. If we carry ourselves with dignity, we may not need to see any more of him. You may not. Alas, I now have lessons with him, Leah said. And whatever did he mean by addressing my accent so harshly? I suppose he meant to say that you sounded uncivilised, Agnes remarked. He is trying to get under your skin one way or another, and you must not let him. I do not sound uncivilised, do I? Leah asked, feeling fairly confident she did not, and yet immediately full of doubt. Not so much as to need coaching. Not at all, Agnes replied. I come from a background equal to his, and I have never taken issue with your accent. In fact, I am not sure anything could be done about it even if it were a problem. It is part of you. Then why the enunciation coaching? Leah asked. 
I bet it's the Duchess of Dorset, Julie piped up. Her grace might not be sure what to make of us, and maybe asking her son to keep a close eye on affairs, and this is his way of making sure he knows what we are doing. But why? Talia asked. We of all people should present the least issue. Agnes shook her head. No, we are the greatest issue. Should we do well, it would reflect most excellently on her school. But if four perfectly decent young ladies come out of her school worse than we started, it would be her greatest shame. But why me? Leah asked. Why single me out of all of us to be observed? Well, you are a little outspoken and bold for a woman in your position, Agnes said. And perhaps you have not been singled out. Perhaps we shall all be observed in different ways. Before we continue into the story, make us a favor. Hit the subscribe button. This way we will be able to create more audiobooks for free for you. Thank you again. Now, back to our story. But only I am being observed by someone from the very family that owns the school, Leah lamented as they entered their quarters and began undressing. It is a great burden. And a great privilege, Agnes insisted. Not only are you representing us, but you are representing the school. Do not fear your place here. Use it to make yourself look to be the best young woman you can be and make us all proud. I feel sorry for you, Julie said. I cannot imagine having to do so much. Leah nodded sharply. I shall endeavour to behave with the utmost dignity and grace to protect all our reputations and our place here. And if I ever need advice on how to appear more refined, on how to remain confident and positive, or on how to overcome my hurdles, I know I can turn to you. The other three girls beamed. But Leah meant every word of it. They all had their strengths, and she greatly admired Agnes's poise, Talia's optimism, and Julie's perseverance. She could only wish she would one day possess those traits as well. But for now, she did not. And that was a problem, because they would not be present to support her when she finally had to pass the Marquis' judgment. Leah wasn't sure quite what she would face when the time came for her supposed enunciation classes. She could only hope it would not be too much. She had never been vocally trained before, not for speech or music. The extent of her vocal training in languages had been correct pronunciation. Enunciation was something she had only heard as a little girl when she spoke too quietly or indistinctly, and her father's older guests would chastise her and demand, Enunciate, girl! If the Marquis' lessons were anything like that, being shouted at until she spoke louder and clearer, she was not sure she could handle it. But she had to. She had to give a good impression, no matter how difficult she found it. Not just for herself, but for her friends also. Their very fates might ride on not irritating the Marquis. A part of her was still slightly thrilled to be about to spend some time with such a handsome, powerful man. Back when she was still an ordinary, eligible young lady seeking a husband, he would have been the sort of suitor she would have swooned over. And although she knew better than to give in to temptation, there was naturally no harm in admiring the good Lord's work in such a fine physique and a chiselled face. The Marquis was, on the surface, everything a young man ought to be. It was a shame that he seemed to have such an appalling personality. Leah would give him a chance to prove himself a good man, of course but resisting temptation would not be too difficult. Chapter 5 The Annunciation lesson was to be held in the library, with a servant as an escort. At least that far, all seemed above board and appropriate. Though Leah was conscious, it was nevertheless a departure from the promised female teachers, female students arrangement. Arriving early, Leah sat down in a chair facing a coffee table and looked around. As of yet, no servant and no other student was visible in the library. It seemed that it was set up to be a private lesson. Leah was in part grateful that she would not need to worry about being seen with the Marquis. Just as she was wondering about the implications of being alone with him, the door opened. The servant did not announce the Marquis like she had the Duchess, but he strode in ahead as she held the door for him. Leah leapt to her feet and curtsied deeply, peering up at him through the strands of hair that fell loosely from her fringe. The Marquis smiled, but not teasingly this time. Rather, he seemed warm and welcoming. 
please do take a seat, Miss Drew. It was a sudden departure from how he had been at dinner the night before, and the aura that surrounded him was much closer to that which had surrounded him in the gardens when she had first bumped into him. Leah felt pleasantly surprised and smiled back, standing and sitting down as he followed suit. Is my enunciation truly so troublesome, my lord? she asked, feeling a little self-conscious despite her best efforts to remain calm. I had never been told it was a problem before. He shook his head a little. I suppose it never was a problem before. But now you shall be expected to educate young ladies, some of a much higher class than yourself, and you need to do much, much better than you have ever done before. Agnes says my accent is acceptable, Leah insisted, realising that he was being gentle and polite enough that perhaps she could persuade him to talk more candidly with her. Is my lord certain that it cannot be tolerated in a governess? Different classes of people have different standards of what is right, I suppose, the Marquis explained, and your enunciation could do with a little work. You do not want the daughter of an earl speaking with your, um, drawl. Leah raised an eyebrow. What is wrong with my drawl, my lord? Suddenly he seemed incredibly uncomfortable. Leah felt about to laugh at how much he blushed, how awkward he seemed. The tables had turned and rather dramatically. Well, there is nothing wrong with it personally, Miss Drew. I have no personal issue. But I must simply consider the needs and demands of our clients. I cannot be justified in sending them someone who is going to give their daughter any accent but the Queen's one, he rambled. It did not take a genius to see that the Marquis was lying. But why? Why go to all this trouble to keep an eye on Lear? Surely he could just confess to what he was doing, bow his head a little, apologise and continue to observe her. It was not as though she had anything to hide, or that she could hide anything even if she had something worth hiding. Leah giggled a little, then stifled it and pressed her hand to her mouth gently. I do apologise, my lord. I suppose I am nervous about the lesson. Do not be, he said. It shall be fine. Now take this book. He handed her a large tome of poetry. What is this for, my lord? Leah asked, leafing through the worn-out pages. I believe you ought to sit and read to me, in a loud, clear voice, so that your enunciation may get better, he said. Oh, so my lord shall correct me as I speak, and I shall learn from my mistakes, she asked. He shook his head. Oh, no, I would hate to interrupt as you read. No, you must listen to your own voice and correct yourself as you hear mistakes. Then at the end, I shall give you advice on what to do next. With all due respect, my lord, I believe that correcting me during the reading might better assist in improving my enunciation, she contested. He shook his head, still smiling warmly. With all due respect, Miss Drew, I am the teacher, and you are the student, and this is the best possible way. Leah was fairly sure that it did not work that way. She knew full well why he would not correct her as she read. He was not correcting her because there was nothing to correct. They both knew that other than a slight drawl to her accent, it was perfect. Her pronunciation was crystal clear and elevated. Her vowels had all the perfect tones. He could not correct her without making it painfully evident she did not need the classes. So she was simply to sit in the library and read to him for an hour or two every day. As far as surveillance went, it sounded much easier than expected, but also incredibly tedious. But it was her duty to carry herself with dignity and grace and make sure that the Duchess got a good impression of all the girls. So she nodded, opened the book, and began reciting the poems. As she spoke, the Marquis lay back on the sofa in an ungraceful manner, one foot on the sofa and the other hanging off it, facing Leah, listening to her read with a smile plastered on his face. He seemed very much at ease with the situation, simply enjoying the poetry and Leah's company. It was too much at times to look over and see him gazing at her so gently. She kept losing her place and stammering when she caught him staring, and eventually told herself not to look up and let him unsettle her. Head down, she read and read until it was time to leave and then bid a swift farewell before returning to her quarters. Leah could scarcely wait to recount her surreal experience to the other girls 
and see what they made of it, because she felt clueless. He had not criticised her, nor had he taught her anything. He had been much warmer, much gentler than at dinner, but he had also made her incredibly uncomfortable. In fact, had a servant not been there, she would have greatly feared for her reputation and left. The way he had been lounging was not simply indecent, it was enticing, and that was her true problem. When he had been acting so detestably at dinner, it was easy to resist his good looks and power. But when in private, with him being almost sweet to her, much more of a gentleman and much kinder, he was so tempting. Walking into the room, the atmosphere was so tense Leah could have cut it with a knife. All the girls were sitting on the edge of Agnes's bed. Agnes, who was usually perfectly composed and dignified, was broken, eyes puffy, cheeks and nose red, leaning into Talia's warm hug. It was clear that there was more going on than just Leia's concerns about the Marquis, and Agnes's problem would have to come first. Whatever is the matter? Leah asked, sitting down on the edge of the bed beside Julie and reaching over to clasp Agnes's hand. Agnes just shook her head, clearly too upset to talk about it, or at least too proud to speak when she would no doubt be hoarse from crying and potentially begin to weep again as soon as she did. She simply picked up a letter from her skirts and handed it over to Leah. From the looks on the other girls' faces, Leah knew she was the last to read the letter, and it was not good news. She curled her feet up underneath herself on the bed and unfolded the thick, heavy paper. There was not much writing on it, but the handwriting was fine, and the paper was clearly expensive. The letter was from Agnes's aunt, the last of her relatives, to talk to her about her sudden misfortune and the news was the same. She could not take Agnes in. Agnes was not wanted in France, and would she perhaps consider taking on some form of gainful employment, or perhaps joining a convent? The wording was so gentle and simple, and yet the full, cruel message was conveyed impeccably. Agnes had no place to go, and all whom she had considered to be a friend had turned their backs on her. She had gone from everyone's darling to a paria over the course of a few weeks. I am so sorry, Agnes, Leah said, feeling genuinely hurt on behalf of her friend. I cannot believe I am forced to remain here, Agnes said, tears rolling down her cheeks. They could have helped me. Would I not have helped them if they were in my position? And yet not one of them would consider me a friend, let alone family. I do not understand why, though. Julie mused. You are a lovely, well-connected young lady. Your father is, was the Earl of Kent. Surely there should be some fortune to give you, or your position should matter to them. Agnes shook her head slowly. All they know is that my inheritance was nil, my uncle has received the title, and therefore I am just another person trying to claim something from a small pool of assets my father left behind. I do not wish for anything but to rejoin the family, but it seems that is too much to ask. One needs to be always grateful for all that one has, Talia said softly. I know it is difficult, but at least we have been given an opportunity. Even if we have no family, no friends besides one another, no wealth and no place to call our own, at least we do have the school, the employment it offers, and each other as friends. Julie nodded eagerly. We may not have much, Agnes but that does not mean we have nothing. I know you were holding out for someone to save you, but if that day will never come, you must do as we do and accept it with dignity. It is different for you. You have no choice. I had people who ought to have cared for me, Agnes said flatly. What do you know about having everything dangled before your very nose, only to have it roughly pulled back? Julie fell silent and shook her head a little. Talia petted Agnes's thick black hair gently. But it is not different. What does it matter that we had nothing from the get-go and you had a few hopes for the future which you have lost? We are all equals here, in this room. Agnes sniffed. I do not mean to offend, Talia, but can you not see why being your equal may hurt a woman like me? Talia fell silent, but continued petting Agnes's hair reassuringly. Leah could tell from the tension that the other girls were in fact offended by Agnes's words. Leah completely understood, though. 
she understood why someone from Agnes's background would take the fall harder than the others. She had fallen so much further and lost so much more. Not only that, but for every step she fell from, she had someone who could have extended a helping hand to her. And they did not. Leah, Julie and Talia had fallen off a few social strata and been caught at the bottom by the Duchess. Agnes had fallen down a social cliff and every time she had attempted to regain her footing, she had been kicked down again. And yet Talia was right as well. All that mattered now was that all four were equals from this day onward. Chapter 6 At her next enunciation lesson, Leah was not sure what to say or do to end up in the Marquis' good books, not to mention to be on good terms with the Duchess. Whatever he was looking out for, it had to be something subtle. She spoke very little of herself, instead listening to the Marquis' concerns and reading to him from whichever book he chose. So what was he looking for? Was he observing her movements, her clothing, testing her patience? Perhaps she had been wrong all along, and he did genuinely believe that she needed to correct her accent, and this was the best way of doing it. Truth be told, Leah didn't mind. She was beginning to enjoy sitting there, reading to the Marquis and listening to him talk about his life. But as the lesson carried on, and as she read, she found her voice carrying itself just fine, her mind beginning to wander a little. Perhaps the reason she enjoyed hearing the Marquis talk about the simple things that were happening in his life was because her own life was once this simple and pleasant. Once she too had to worry about what the servants were doing and what to wear that morning and how much or how little was appropriate to eat in front of a distinguished guest. On the other hand, she found it pleasing to know exactly what was expected of her when she was with the Marquis. She had to listen, and she had to read. That was easy enough. And when she didn't allow herself to worry about whether he was or was not monitoring her, it was very easy to relax and enjoy his company. Life had been much simpler with her father to guide her. He had always known just what to say to make her feel well, just what she ought to do to obtain all she desired, and when her desires were best left unmet. His wisdom had given her the strength to become a decent young lady, despite her lack of a mother. Leah could not help but think of the life and people she had left behind, of all the friends and places she would miss. But none of them had been willing or able to look after her. Some had turned their backs on her entirely after discovering her desperate circumstances. After all, after losing one's status, the next greatest shame to many young women was continuing to associate with someone who had lost their status. On the one hand, Leah did not want to resent them for abandoning her. She understood that they feared becoming outcasts, and that as soon as one young woman rejected her, the rest were sure to follow, to avoid falling out of favour with one another. But on the other hand, she also knew they were overreacting, and that their pettiness had cost her almost every friendship she had, at a time when, not having any family, friendship was dearly needed. It was not uncommon for a woman of her standing to become a governess. But it was uncommon for someone so young to be so alone. She was not sure how she was coping, other than with the support of her three closest friends and the kindness of charity and those were external support. Internally, she still felt hollow, like a void had been left inside her heart where her father used to reside, and nothing and nobody could ever take his place. Leah knew that it would do no good to sit there dwelling on matters that had already passed. She needed to simply be grateful for what she still had. Talia always put it so well, her words always so encouraging but it was difficult to take it to heart. How was Leah supposed to be grateful when the one person she had always cared for, always relied upon, and always known was gone forever? They were all in the same situation, and yet Leah knew she did not have the tools the others did to cope. Agnes had her connections, and although most had failed, the Duchess was only caring for the girls thanks to Agnes's relationship with her. Talia had already gone through the sudden loss of a parent and had learned from her experience. And Julie still had her mother, even if nothing else, to turn to should times get even harder. It was only Leah who had nobody but the other three. 
It was only Leah who took it upon her shoulders to be the responsible one supporting the others. It was only Leah who felt suspended, alone in the world. You are reading very nicely, please do not stop, the Marquis remarked in a slow, low voice. Do you not wish to improve your enunciation, Miss Drew? Leah sighed a little and nodded, locating her place in the book and beginning to read again. You have already read that part, the Marquis said, looking up at her, peering through her very soul, as though he knew something was wrong. Truth be told, I do not wholly understand why I need to carry out these exercises, my lord, Leah confessed, her voice somewhat shaky. There are so many skills which I genuinely lack, and my accent is the least of my troubles. I could possibly be using my time better by learning more about social order from Agnes, or about hard graft from Julie, or about keeping my energy up from Talia. I could be studying music, or making connections, or learning about child development. Instead, I am here reading to my lord, not truly learning anything more about enunciation, and worrying about where the future will take me. The Marquis listened intently, and as she finished he smiled softly. Very well. It is not for your enunciation. But you must do it nonetheless, as it is for a very good cause, the Marquis insisted. I find that your reading soothes me and helps me to think. And you are learning to repeat yourself, to be patient, and to remain still and serene, all skills which will be required of you daily as a governess. Leah felt her cheeks hot with shame as she realised how rude, inconsiderate and rash she had been. I am so sorry, my lord. I spoke too soon, and I spoke out of anger. I did not intend to question my lord's intentions, and I hope my lord can find it in his heart to forgive me. There is nothing to forgive, he said in the same soft tone of voice. All I wish is for you to continue reading to me in the full knowledge that it is as much to my benefit as it is to yours. Of course, my lord, Leah said with a relieved smile, picking up the book once again. And Leah, he said even more quietly, sending shivers down her spine as he used her first name. Please call me James. That is my name, and I would like you to use it. I beg your pardon, my lord, Leah asked, looking up from the book, not quite sure if she had heard him correctly. I would like you to call me James. Use my Christian name. I much prefer it, he explained. Leah felt her heart beating fast. My lord, that would be wholly inappropriate. We must refer to one another civilly. We are in private, and besides, I do not see myself as a marquis or a lord of any kind, he replied. That is a title my father wishes me to carry, so that I might seem more important when being introduced to his friends. It bears no real responsibilities nor privileges beyond those I already possessed as the son of a duke. Leah nodded and smiled. And I understand that wholeheartedly, my lord. But to me you shall always be my better, and I do not feel it would be right to call someone of such status by anything other than their title. Oh, but I do insist. And as you see me as the lord of this house or this school, this building, however you see it, you ought to respect my wishes the Marquis said. You cannot honour me in name and then proceed to ignore my rank. That would be terribly hypocritical, would it not? Leah felt herself painted into a corner. He had a very good point. As a Marquis, she ought to submit to his wishes. And yet as a Marquis, she also could not bear the thought of calling him by his first name, as she did with her friends. She pondered the matter a little longer. Not at all, my lord. Leah finally replied, I do not see you as the lord of this house, this school, or this building. Her grace, the duchess, your mother is the sole proprietor and manager of this estate, and I do not think it would be in her wishes for a common, destitute girl such as myself to use my lord's first name. I must respect her wishes if I am to live under her roof. But as a guest in this house you are to respect not only my mother, but also myself, the Marquis said with a smirk. Do you not fear that I may turn her against you? I do not. My lord is too good of a Christian Englishman to do such a terrible thing out of spite. And as a good Christian Englishwoman, I must also respect myself, my people, and the crown, Leah insisted. 
The Marquis laughed a little. I had not suspected you would be so bold, and yet such a conformist, he remarked. You get more interesting each time I meet you. I dare say you are the most fascinating little creature I have ever met. I might be fascinating, but I am not a creature. I am a lady, Leah insisted, feeling emboldened by his banter and eager not to be put down any further than was necessary, considering the enormous gap between their statuses. Very well. I suppose that as a lady I cannot ask you to do something which you feel too uncomfortable to do, the Marquis conceded, sounding a little defeated, but still smiling, eyes still sparkling with humour. I am very glad to have you here, and I would not like to scare you away by not considering your feelings. Leah sighed in relief. I am glad that my lord understands. I do not wish to insult my lord either, nor to disobey his wishes. But I am afraid that the wishes of a duchess, and those of all of England, must be respected slightly more closely than those of a marquis who does not even want his title. I am sure anyone would agree. Just promise me that if you ever should feel any differently about the situation, you will use my name, at least once or twice, he asked. I would love to hear it from your lips. I am sure it would sound most charming. Did my lord not say that my accent was unsophisticated? Leah asked mischievously. Oh, it is. But it is also charming. One could almost say quaint, he replied without missing a beat, making Leah blush and bristle with slight frustration. I am sure you would say my name so beautifully. I am sure I would also, Leah replied, before looking down the page for her place and beginning to read again. Yes. She could say his name just as well as any other young lady with any other accent. But after that behaviour he had hardly earned hearing it. Looking at him out of the corner of her eye, she was somewhat entertained by the change which had come over him. There was something softer, gentler, meeker in his expression now. Something kinder in his eyes than in public. Leah could see another type of handsomeness in him now. She knew she ought to control her urges towards him. After all, he was simply being friendly towards her, was he not? Treating her as a brother would treat his sister. After all, why else would he tease her and toy with her emotions so much? She could not afford to find him any more attractive than she already did. For her own sake, she needed distance. Chapter 7 It seemed that one of their many duties at the school, as some of the most educated of all the young women in attendance, was to give prospective students a good impression of the facilities. They had not been informed of this duty during their application, but it certainly seemed to be part of their role. They had been informed, on the closing of their fifth day of lessons at the school, that the next morning they would be expected to speak of their experiences at the school to some high-class parents and guardians, who were contemplating sending a girl there. They would be expected to dress well, explain what their lessons consisted of, and not disclose unless absolutely necessary that they had not even been there a week. The idea was obviously to give the impression that their time at the school had made them into the young ladies they were. Leah was more than happy to do this. In a sense it was lying, of course. But the Duchess's school was, without a doubt, an excellent place, and the Duchess had done them all an enormous favour. It would not be deceit so much as repayment for their lessons and it was not as though any girl sent there would not do well. On the contrary, many young ladies trained at the school were just as sophisticated as the four friends. It just so happened that the girls were the most likely to give a favourable impression. I am not so sure, Agnes said wearily. These events are hardly a walk in the park. We must all put in great effort to impress. She looked at the dresses they were hanging up on the wardrobe doors, to make sure they were uncreased and ready for the day ahead. But the Duchess is the only person who did not turn her back on you, Leah replied. You must treat her with some respect for that alone. Agnes nodded. I shall, I shall. I am simply saying it will not be easy, and we must expect to work hard to achieve the results Her Grace expects of us. Julie went a little pale. Oh, I would hate to disappoint them. What if they become angry with me over something silly I say or do wrong? Do not worry, Julie, Talia said with a smile. 
These are gentlemen and ladies, and they shall surely be wonderful people to their peers and their lesser. I do hope so, Julie replied. I'm not sure I could cope with being told off or shouted at. You must endeavour to become stronger, more hardened against criticism, Leia said to Julie somewhat sternly. As an employee in a home, you may be told that you need to correct your behaviour. You may even be shouted at times, either due to your own fault or due to the nature of your employer. Julie shuddered. Oh, I shall never do this. How could a girl like me possibly manage such a horrible situation? She sat down on her bed, a tear escaping her eye. Well then, Talia mused, perhaps you could meet a nice young man of a similar class to your father and perhaps avoid needing to become a governess at all. Julie pursed her lips and nodded sternly. You are right. This is not the only path my life may take. Exactly, Talia said, sitting beside Julie and embracing her. It is more of a first step towards a future where you are able to choose between many different options, and I am sure that you shall do perfectly well. The next morning, it was as though something had taken over Julie. She was the first to get out of bed, wash and brush her hair, long before the other girls had summoned the energy to leave the comfort of their sheets. She was dressed just as they began to wash and spent a good half an hour on arranging her hair, powdering her cheeks and perfuming herself. Leah was somewhat impressed with how good Julie looked. She was graceful and appropriate, and yet ethereal and sublime, like a Greek statue. She still had those hints of girlishness about her, as the youngest in the group, but she was definitely much more of a woman than Leah had realised. How had she grown up so much so fast? It was surreal. Walking downstairs, the girls were ushered into the drawing room by some servants, where it was set for tea and cake. Already used to bread and cheese or savoury porridge for breakfast, the prospect of a sweet start to the day elevated their moods enormously. Wait here for the Duchess and the Earl to arrive the servant said as she left, closing the door behind herself. It all made sense. If the guest of honour was an earl, then of course the duchess would want him to think well of her school. It would take a lot to impress a man of that sort of stature, much more than the usual sales pitch of all female teachers and big gardens. They had no more time to think as the door swung open. Introducing Lord Mulgrave and Her Grace the Duchess of Dorset, the servant declared. On cue, the girls curtsied deeply as the Duchess and her guest entered the room. It was only after a few seconds when they stood up that they realised how young he was. And Leah was not the only one to notice something else. How intently he looked at Julie. As the Duchess encouraged the Earl to begin talking to the women and learning about their experiences there, Julie and the Earl moved close towards one another. Are you enjoying your studies here? he asked her. Julie nodded. Lord Mulgrave, I can guarantee your daughter shall be treated well and work hard. Oh no, my dear, said the Earl of Mulgrave with a slight laugh. I am unwed. Besides, a daughter of mine would not need to attend any place of education. Julie blushed and nodded. Do you believe the daughter of an Earl would have to come here? he asked. Bar some terribly unfortunate circumstances, most educated young ladies do not need to work. Speaking of which, what came to pass for such a fine creature as yourself to end up here? Leah winced. Firstly because they were so blatant, and secondly because the Earl too was calling women creatures. She was not sure how often she could bear to hear that. I lost my father, Julie replied. In fact, we all did. And if you have no daughter, why are you contemplating this school? It is for my niece he explained to Julie's intent little face. She is of a lower birth, and she wants to make herself useful by becoming governess to a friend of the family. But of course no friend of mine would hire a governess who did not have some sort of credentials, no matter how much of a friend she may be to them. So, my niece must come here. Julie nodded. And I suppose that if she is to stay here, my lord might visit from time to time? He nodded back with a slight grin. Why, of course. Anyone observing might have easily mistaken Julie's behaviour for genuine interest or childishness, but Leah and Talia knew much better. 
this was not how Julie was. Julie was a shy, reserved girl who had a very hard time, not just with other people, but with men especially. And yet here she was, dressed up, getting close to a man of some status, inquiring about his family life and intention to visit. It was fairly obvious she was simply taking Talia's words to heart, pursuing a man whose company might spare her the trials and tribulations of becoming a governess. After all, were she to wed Lord Mulgrave, or even become his friend, she would be supported once again and no longer need to consider employment. The Duchess was also unimpressed. She was not a foolish woman, and she was keenly aware of the dynamics in a room of people. And so far, only one of her guests was present, allowing her to focus entirely on the language, verbal and physical, between the Earl and the young women. A woman of her age and experience could no doubt see Julie's tilted head, the smile on her lips, and the glint in her eyes. Not to mention, the Duchess knew full well how modestly Julie usually dressed, and would have noticed the dress from the moment she walked in through the door. Leah could see her grace's lips purse, but could not do anything. After all, the Duchess would be well within her rights to do whatever she saw necessary to protect the reputation of her school and its students. And Leah could hardly walk up to Julie and warn her either. This would simply have to run its course. Julie seemed a little giddy, as though she was lost in her own thoughts. But that was not going to last very long. The Duchess nodded in Julie's direction. The first time Julie completely missed the signal, too busy laughing with the Earl about how simple and uneducated the typical nanny was, and how important it was to hire a woman of some class to raise children. But then Agnes gently put her hand on Julie's shoulder. As Julie's eyes lifted, she paled a little, noticing an angry fire behind the Duchess's calm exterior. She smiled, excused herself, and walked towards the Duchess, who turned on her heels and walked out the door. As Julie followed the Duchess out of the room, trying to keep her head high but clearly nervous, Leah resisted the temptation to follow. The servant slipped out behind both women and shut the door lightly. Leah wished she could be out there, listening to what was taking place, possibly offering support to Julie, or even defending her if possible. At the very least, Leah would like to hear what they were saying, so she could offer Julie some comfort and support later, in their quarters, when Julie would no doubt need a shoulder to cry on. But Leah's bigger responsibility was to the group, to the Duchess, and to the Earl. So she remained where she was, responding to his questions as civilly as she could, reminding herself that she could ask Julie later about the conversation. It seemed that Talia had not been able to resist the same way that Leah and Agnes had. Looking up, Leah noticed a few moments later that Talia had vanished, the door to the hallway conspicuously ajar. Wherever the Duchess and Julie were, Talia was either joining the conversation or watching it take place from a distance. Agnes glanced at the door also, and as the Earl made his way to the table to be served a slice of cake, Leah leaned in to whisper in Agnes's ear. I wish I could see where they went, Leah said. I would actually like to know, Agnes said, blushing a little at admitting to her shameful need to gossip. I hope that Julie tells us all that is said, so we may help her, of course. Leah smiled knowingly. Of course. But before another word could be said, and before the Earl could make his way back over to the women with his slice of cake, the door was thrown open and the Marquis of Salisbury strode in like a soldier marching onto the battlefield, looking around the room only to focus on Leah and Agnes. Have either of you seen Miss Lily? the Marquis asked, his brow furrowed with concern. Mother feels she was too harsh and the girl ran away. Mother asked to see her so she might apologise, but the girl is nowhere to be found. She has not yet returned, my lord, Leah replied. We believed she was still speaking with your mother. The Marquis shook his head. She is not. She ran off, like a child throwing a tantrum. Leah could tell from Agnes's expression that this meant the meeting with the Earl had not gone well and all their efforts were wasted. After all, to have a girl run away and to have the son of the school's owner call said girl a child was surely enough to put the Earl off sending his niece there. But Leah was not particularly bothered about that. She was more worried about where Julie, and to a lesser extent, 
Talia had gone. Chapter 8 As soon as the Marquis had guided the Earl away, either to apologise for the drama or to ask him to leave, the room descended into a state of despair. Julie was by far the baby of the group, and for her to vanish like that, without a trace, was terrifying for both of the other girls. Their only hope was that Talia was with her, somewhere such as the gazebo in the garden, and they would both soon return to the school to receive a scolding and return to normalcy. But that hope was dashed when Talia walked in, her face pale. Leah, Agnes, you would not believe it, Julie has... Vanished? Agnes asked. Talia shook her head. She ran out the front door. I meant to stop her, but by the time I got there she was gone. I fear she has run away. I cannot believe it, Agnes said, somewhere between alarm and confusion. Oh, surely it is a mistake. Perhaps she is in the gardens. She is probably hiding somewhere out under the gazebo, or in the stables. Talia drew a deep breath. I am not sure. I hope so. She moved so fast. I wanted to stop her, but she wouldn't listen. Shall we go and look for her? We must wait for the Duchess's instructions. Perhaps a party is already on its way, Agnes replied, trying to maintain her composure. Talia was on the verge of tears, and Leah embraced her closely, kissing her forehead. All will be well. I am sure Agnes is right. The Duchess said such horrible things, Talia said, furrowing her brow. I cannot believe what she said. Leah still held Talia close. What did she say? Talia's voice dropped, as though wanting to hide her gossip from the servants, as though the Duchess herself could be behind any door, listening to everything Talia said. She called Julie an unrestrained girl, and said she didn't think any of us were of that sort. She said that Julie's mother ought to have raised her better, but nevertheless Julie ought to know better than to parade herself. Julie was so sad, I could have... Oh, I cannot even say what I wished to do to the Duchess when I saw what she did to poor Julie. Talia, Agnes exclaimed, it is not the Duchess's fault. She is a respectable lady who was simply advising Julie to act like a lady also. Julie is not a lady, though, Talia replied. She is a girl. She might be on the verge of womanhood, but she is not yet as mature or as strong as we are. Her grace ought to have considered this rather than speak to her like that. Perhaps that was the only way of ensuring Julie learned her lesson, Agnes replied. Talia glared at Agnes. I cannot believe you would not defend a friend who clearly was not prepared for such treatment, she said coldly. Leah felt her heart ache for her friend. On the one hand, she understood the Duchess's motives in chastising Julie for her behaviour. Julie had to learn that, even if it was her ultimate goal to wed a wealthy man and escape her misfortune, there were better ways of doing this. In the short term, Julie's behaviour would leave her rejected by finer society and mistreated by men who wished to take advantage of her. In the long term, it could leave her without friends, work, marriage prospects or anything else of value. Someone had to warn her long before it got to that point and put her back on the correct path. But Julie was not as hardened or as self-assured as the rest of them. Her mother came from a much lower background and had fought tooth and claw to attain and retain something resembling status. In doing so, Lady Lily had been sure to hide the hardships of life from her daughter, assuming that her own efforts were enough to secure their future. In a strange twist of fate, Julie Lilly was more sheltered than any of her friends, wholly unequipped with any of the skills which had been of use to her mother. All because they both believed Sir Lilly would be able to support them forever. That had not been the case. And now this sheltered girl had been placed in a position where she was contemplating following in her mother's footsteps, but did not know the first thing about how to do it. Those simple words that were a cross to bear for Agnes and slightly rude but tolerable to Talia and Leah, must have been like a knife through Julie's heart. Not only because it was an attack on her, but an attack on her mother, on her life, on her very existence. The Duchess's words had left it clear, in no uncertain terms, that to be a woman seeking her fortune by using her charms was not respected. 
and whereas any of the other three women would have understood that to mean one could not overtly charm her way into fortune, to Julie it meant one could not ever charm her way into fortune, making her mother, and even herself, completely unrespectable women. Walking the halls of the building, Leah had expected there to be some commotion. After all, one of the most noble students at the school had vanished. But the other younger girls were just walking to their lessons, sitting in the music rooms with a teacher, in the library taking notes. It was all so quiet and peaceful, just like any other day at the school. All members of staff were even accounted for, as far as Leah could tell. It was as if nobody had been mobilised at all, as if the only people looking for Julie were Leah, Agnes, Talia and the Marquis. It felt so horribly wrong. Leah could not quite put her finger on why, but it did. It was like Julie had simply vanished, and nothing about it mattered to anyone. It was up to her to rescue her beloved friend. Nobody else could or would. But surely that could not be the case. Surely it was just a matter of timing. Julie had only just left, and from the sound of it, although Talia saw her leave, nobody else did, which meant nobody knew she was outside the building. And why would they suspect such a thing without due cause? The school was vast and fairly busy. They would search it top to bottom three or four times before suspecting that a young woman had fled on her own. Even the garden would not be considered before the school was thoroughly inspected. Determined to put things right, Leah began searching for the Duchess. She, of all people, would be willing and able to help. She knew what she had said to Julie, and she had a vested interest in ensuring Julie was found well and safe. Not only that, but she ran the school and knew everywhere a young woman might try and hide in shame or anger. She had the financial and physical resources to devote to looking beyond the school gates for Julie. But Leah could not find her. Surrendering, she headed for the girls' quarters, finding Agnes and Talia there already, both seeming deeply concerned, but unable to do anything. Any luck? Talia asked, sounding defeated already. Leah shook her head. No, I can't find her anywhere, and her grace is nowhere to be found either. I believe she is the only person who could help us find Julie. I agree. She would be the perfect person for the task, Agnes agreed with a sharp nod. Have you not seen any sign of her grace? None at all. All the classes are carrying on as normal, all the girls are going about their day like nothing has occurred at all, Leah explained. I believe she wants to keep this a secret, for whatever reason she might have. Probably because it is the Duchess's fault in the first place, and it will bring her shame, Talia said. Agnes ignored that remark, but was clearly stung by any attack on her friend and their benefactress. I shall seek the Duchess. I am sure to know where she would be in this building. Talia... You must see if Julie is still here. Talia paused, then asserted with a sharp nod of her head. Yes, I know the places where she might be hiding. I shall inspect them all, to make sure she has not re-entered the building and see if perhaps she is still in the gardens. That is a most excellent idea, Leah replied with a smile. And what am I to do? You must find the Marquis, Agnes replied. He is the only other person who already knows of the situation, and we need as many people as possible to assist in locating her. Leah felt more than a little uncomfortable at this proposition. After all, there was something odd about how the Marquis acted around her. Not only that, but she found him strangely alluring. His handsomeness was only the tip of the iceberg. He was also soft and gentle towards her. He was kind to her as long as they were alone and he had become insistent that Leah ought to treat him with increasing intimacy. It was clear as day to Leah that they were beginning to grow fond of one another, which was highly inappropriate. And were it up to her, she would not see him again, not for her lessons, much less seek him out. She needed to maintain a distance between them. But it was not for herself. It was for Julie. And it did not need to be in private, did it? She could easily just talk to him in the halls. That way they would be able to talk more or less freely, but without the awkwardness and the temptation of spending time in private with a man who quite clearly desired her. 
As Agnes left to find the Duchess and Talia set off for the gardens, Leah once again hesitated. She wondered whether she could hide in the room and claim she was unable to find him. But no, that would be wrong. Stealing herself, she set off, wondering where in this vast building she might find the Marquis. She still felt a little nervous. She didn't want to admit it, even to herself. But there was something pleasant about being alone with the Marquis. She could not help but wonder whether she really was actively resisting the temptation of his beautiful self, or if she was just pretending to resist, putting in a little token propriety, and then giving in. After all, she could have said she would not seek him. She could have traded places with Agnes. She even could have explained her troubles to the other girls. But no, a part of her wanted to keep her guilty pleasure a secret, so that she could continue to indulge it unnoticed. Although it seemed that reality was on side with her modesty. Looking in the library, knocking on the door of his private study, and asking a servant exiting his quarters, she found no sign of his presence anywhere. She was a little disappointed, but also a little relieved to be preparing to return to the girls' room. Just as Leah was beginning to give up, she spied him walking down the hall towards the gardens. Marching up to him, she gently called out, My lord? Lord Salisbury? she asked. He turned around, his clear blue eyes glistening beautifully, a white smile flashing briefly. Yes, Miss Drew, he replied. Leah drew a deep breath and smiled softly back. This was all for Julie. And in part for Talia and Agnes, of course. This was not for herself, not for the Marquis, not for their private pleasure. But by God was he handsome. Chapter 9 My lord, Leah said, curtsying low and trying to avoid eye contact with him. Although it was a public space, it was very noticeable that they were alone. In fact, they were more alone than usual, with no chaperone, no supervision, no servants even in sight. She could feel her heart pounding hard in her chest, and yet she relished the moment. Peering up, she saw he was gazing intently at her, a soft, half-focused grin spread across his lips a dazed glow behind his eyes. He looked so handsome, so perfect, and the softness of his expression towards her was delightful. Oh, Leah, he said with a warm smile, how wonderful to see you. I'm so sorry about what Mother said to your friend, Miss Lily. Leah shook her head dismissively. Not at all. What her grace said is not the trouble. The trouble is who she said it to. Julie is a little sensitive. The Marquis stepped in a little closer, his hand raising slightly towards her before he apparently realised what he was doing, and lowered it. But I am sorry nevertheless, Leah, he replied. Please do tell me, how is Julie feeling now? I do not know. She is still absent, Leah replied. That is why I am looking for my lord, to see if you might have found her yet. No, I thought you had found her, the Marquis said softly. You mean to say she has not yet returned? She has not, Leah confirmed, feeling one weight lifted from her chest and another simultaneously added. On the one hand, she now knew why nobody was looking for Julie. They believed she would have returned by now and the alarm had not been raised. On the other hand, Leah felt a slight panic to think that so much time had passed without a search party being organised. Julie could be anywhere by now, especially if she had taken some money with her to pay for a coach, or if she had been seen wandering outside the school and attacked. Do not worry, the Marquis insisted. I am sure she is perfectly all right. But I am worried about her, my lord, Leah replied, trying to hold back her alarm. This is most unlike Julie, and she is so young and vulnerable. Young women do such things all the time, especially if they are a little spirited, the Marquis said. She is not spirited, and she is not just another young woman, my lord, Leah said sharply, finally snapping. She is soft and gentle, and barely more than a girl. She may look like a woman on the outside, but she is still learning how to act as a lady, and a girl like her, out on her own, is in grave danger. In fact, if she has not returned already, I fear the worst, my lord. The Marquis paused, 
a look of confusion spreading over his face, seemingly baffled and surprised by the fact that a young woman under his care would dare talk back to him like that. This confusion was replaced with a stern expression as he realised that Leah was being serious. If you believe harm has befallen her, then I shall endeavour to find her immediately, the Marquis finally replied. You are most correct, Miss Drew. You know her much better than I do, and if you think she could be anywhere at all, tell me so, that I may arrange a search party to find her and bring her home, safe and sound. Leah felt a strange sense of comfort as he said this, like her heart and soul had been enveloped in warmth. Were he her brother or father, she would have embraced him. Oh, thank you, my lord, she replied. I do not know how to express my gratitude. Not at all. It is the right thing to do. Is there anything you could tell me that may help? He asked. Leah nodded. Yes. If she has gone by foot, then she will not have gone far. And if she has been, heaven forbid, taken, then it is a matter for the police. But if she has taken her coin purse and rode a coach anywhere, she might have gone back to the town whence we came, possibly to her old home, or the home of a friend. Does she not have a mother in London? the Marquis asked. In London? Leah asked, suddenly confused. No, her mother is for sure still at home. The Marquis paused. I must be thinking of someone else. I shall set off for your town and inspect your previous addresses. Would it be possible for me to accompany your party? Leah asked tentatively. I should like to be present for my friend. Of course not the Marquis replied. A young woman joining us on such a journey would merely delay our progress. We must get there as soon as possible to help her. Or should she not be there to know and change our course of action? But I could indicate the correct paths and houses, Leah insisted. Leah, you must remain here. It is scandalous enough if one young woman has run from the school. Could you imagine the shame if you were to leave seeking her? He explained. Besides, if she is not there then you will not be with her. Then what am I to do, my lord? Leah asked. Wait here, and be here for her when she returns, he replied. Now I must go. If she is in danger, we cannot delay for a single second. The Marquis raised his hand again, but did not stop himself this time, allowing his soft, strong fingers to gently caress Leah's cheek. His hand felt so warm and firm. Do not fear. I shall do all in my power to help her, the Marquis said softly, before turning around and setting off back inside the school building. Returning to their room after that felt anticlimactic, and not just because her lips ached and tingled, awaiting a kiss from the Marquis. Leah had sorely wanted to leave the building. She had sorely wanted to go on a journey back home and to see her old neighbours, friends and relatives. She missed them so very, very much. In her previous life, that might have been possible. She may have been able to demand to be taken on such a journey, or to make her own arrangements to leave. After all, it was but a day's ride by coach, much less by horseback. It was hardly an adventure for a young woman with wealth and status. But she was no longer a free noblewoman, not in the sense she used to be. Now she had a duty to the school, and to its rules. Even if the Marquis had agreed to take her with his search party, she would have had to ask the Duchess for permission to miss her lessons, leave the premises, and possibly to borrow a horse. And all the time she would spend requesting permission and making arrangements would be time wasted. The Marquis, on the other hand, still enjoyed the same freedoms she no longer possessed. He could simply walk up to some servants, seize a horse, and leave. He was by far more qualified for the task than Leah was. At least it seemed as though the Annunciation lessons would be cancelled for the day, so she would have an hour or two to herself. It was not as though the Marquis had made any arrangements for a substitute teacher and the prospect of sitting in the library, reading out loud to another teacher as she reclined and listened, was amusing to Leah. But on the other hand, this meant she would also be alone with her thoughts. Entering the girls' quarters, Leah was disappointed to find them empty. In such times of silence and solitude, the mind loves to conjure up images of horrible, terrible things. And Leah's mind was no different. 
bringing forth images of all the terrible things which might be happening to poor Julie. And she could do no more. All she could hope was that one of the other girls would come back with good news. So she lay back on her bed in a most undignified manner, reading a book. It was difficult to concentrate on the words, and more than once she found herself reading an entire page twice, as the first time she had simply skimmed over it, not taking in a single word. It was just so hard to try and relax and do something such as read when Julie could be in danger. And yet those thoughts were the very ones she was attempting to dispel. Leah felt immense relief when the door creaked open. It was Talia. From the softness of her expression, it was fairly obvious that she had not found even a clue as to Julie's location. But at least there would be some company for Leah, which was all she truly wanted. No luck? Leah asked, sitting up in a more dignified posture and arranging her skirts neatly. Talia shook her head slowly and sat down beside Leah on the bed. I looked anywhere I thought she might be. You have been friends with her longer than I have. Perhaps you know somewhere I might not have looked. Not at all, Leah said sadly. You and Julie have been truly inseparable. You of all people would know best where she might go. Did you find the Marquis? Julie asked. Leah nodded. Yes, he set off immediately with a search party. Well, that is very nice of him, Talia replied. Also, I suppose it is also his responsibility. We live in a world where a person doing one's duty is not always guaranteed, Leah replied. So there is always some merit in making an effort as he has done. And I ask you to trust me when I say that he was most eager to find her and as worried about her absence as we are. Talia smiled a relieved smile. That is good to hear. As they sat there, Leah's thoughts once again turning to the possible monstrous scenarios Julie might be facing, the door creaked open again. Both girls looked up suddenly, like rabbits startled from grazing. Her grace has not seen Julie since, but she said something about the Marquis organising a search party, Agnes said as she walked in, seeming a little confused. Leah shrugged a little. Quite simply that. The Marquis has arranged a search party, and I would not be surprised if they have already departed, she explained. Where shall they be searching? Do you know? Agnes asked, joining the other two on Leah's bed and glancing disapprovingly at Leah's tousled hair. He will search the roads near the school and perhaps the town, Leah carried on. But I also asked him to go back to our homes and see if she is with a neighbour. That is a good plan, Agnes agreed, reaching up and beginning to gently undo the small knots in Leah's hair arranging her brown tresses delicately. If she has taken any money with her, she would surely return home. Although he said something about her mother being in London, Leah added. Well, I cannot see how that might be the case, Agnes said with a scoff, still untangling Leah's bed-messed hair. Leah just smiled meekly. I wish there was more we could do for Julie. I cannot believe she would simply flee, like a scolded child. But she is a child, Agnes replied. Perhaps not entirely a child, but by far not yet a woman either. And she was scolded. She did not have the sense to stay put. We can only hope she had enough sense not to walk right into the mouth of the wolf, Leah added. Chapter 10 That night, Leah could not sleep. She lay awake. Outside, she could hear the rain falling. And by then... She knew Julie was not in the school. If Julie was in the school, she would have long since returned to her warm, comfortable bed. However angry or confused or ashamed she was, Julie would not submit herself to sleeping in a spare room or in the library or on a settee to make her point. For the first hour or two of the night, Leah waited with slight hope, listening out for the telltale sound of the door creaking open and someone softly tiptoeing into bed but the sound never came because Julie was not in the school. The thought of her dear friend out there, possibly stuck in the rain, bedraggled like some woodland creature, upset Leah. Nobody deserved that, but much less someone as young and foolish as Julie. Perhaps someone older and more mature, who had made such a choice of their own volition, fully aware of the consequences, could do with a little humility brought on by facing the elements and God's power. 
but poor little Julie. She did not deserve to pay so horribly for a simple mistake. And that was if she left of her own free will in the first place. It was all Leah could do to ignore the fear in the back of her mind, telling her that Julie had been taken and would never be seen again. Then a new sound came, the sound of hooves on the pavement in the courtyard. Leah looked up to see if Talia or Agnes had awoken, illuminated by the faint light of the moon that glowed through the slowly dispersing rain clouds. Leah could see that both slept soundly, Agnes exhausted from the day, Talia from crying herself to sleep. Leah gently slipped out of bed, hoping she was not being too loud. The carpet by the side of her bed was not too cold, but as she stepped off it onto the stone by the windowsill, she felt a shiver run down her spine. She shivered again as she felt a slight draught from the window. Nevertheless, she walked right up to it and peered out. Standing at the window, Leah could see that the search party had returned, and it seemed as though there was a young lady with them. Her heart felt somewhat settled, and as if on cue with her emotions, the rain slowly halted entirely. Looking down, Leah watched as the riders dismounted and made their way inside, two of them remaining behind to guide the horses, one by one, to the stables for a dry down, a rub, and some hay. Leah could not bear to wait until Julie got to the room, if that was indeed Julie who was with the men, of course. Leah needed to put her mind at ease right away. Putting on her bed coat and slippers, Leah made sure she was as covered and presentable as possible before seizing a candle. It was a small one, but it would burn for long enough for her to make her way downstairs and back again. Leah contemplated striking a match in the room, but she knew that if the sound and smell did not awaken the other girls, the bright light most certainly would. So she groped her way across the dark side of the room, where the faint moonlight did not penetrate, and eventually found the door, letting herself out and closing it behind herself as quietly as she could. Standing outside, she lit the candle before making her way down the hallway. It would be impossible to see anything in the hall without the light of the candle, and even with it there were many corners that were so dark Leah felt uncomfortable walking past them, as though something would be lurking in there, wishing her harm. She was grateful when she finally saw a doorway illuminated brightly by the fully lit fireplace within, the crackling of the flames and the soft murmur of voices distinctly audible through the open door. Walking up, feeling a little disoriented by the lack of light, Leah realised it was the front room. Although there had been many men with the search party, inside there were only three figures now. The men had since disbanded and left for their quarters. Only one of them remained. The Duchess, the Marquis and Julie stood by the fire. The Marquis and Julie were both shivering slightly, standing as near the flames as possible in an effort to warm themselves after what must have been a long and gruelling ride home. By their feet were two heavy cloaks, dark with rainwater, waiting for a maid to collect them and hang them to dry. The Duchess herself was in her bed coat, nightcap, and slippers as well. Although they were much finer than Leah's, seeing that the highest member of the household was also dressed so casually gave Leah the confidence she needed to enter the room. As she walked in, the Marquis, who had been speaking, fell silent, causing all eyes to turn to her. Leah could see in Julie's eyes that she was very much sorry for herself, but also very happy to see a friend. Oh, Julie! Leah exclaimed forgetting herself for a moment and placing her candle on a small table before rushing to embrace her dear friend. Julie's dress was a little damp, despite the heavy cloak she had been using to cover herself. Julie hugged Leah back, with the sort of tight grip a child reserves for its mother, clearly on the verge of crying, but either holding back or unable to find another tear, having shed them all already. Where were you? Leah asked gently. She was hiding in her old home, the Marquis said. I believe she must have been homesick. Julie nodded. I suppose I was a little, she replied softly into Leah's ear. Was her mother not there? Leah asked, squeezing Julie tightly, not caring that her own bedcoat was slowly absorbing the remaining water from Julie's dress, wanting only to comfort her dear friend. She was not, the Marquis replied. 
Why not? Leah asked. You ask her, Miss Drew, the Marquis said with a chuckle. Leah petted Julie's damp hair. Julie, where is your mother? And why were you hiding there without her? She did not want to tell me why, but perhaps you will have a little more luck, the Marquis remarked, turning about. It does not matter to me. I have done what needed to be done. I must rest now and leave you ladies to whatever gossip you like. Leah could tell that the Marquis did not intend any meanness, but she could also tell that even his own mother, the Duchess, was indignant at the suggestion that they would simply be gossiping. Leah knew full well, from the glance the Duchess cast the Marquis, that she would retain her composure in public, and in private she would explain to her son the importance of maintaining something resembling etiquette when talking to others. For now, nobody spoke until he had left the room. Almost as soon as he was gone, the Duchess turned to face Leah. I understand that you must be thrilled to have your friend back safe and sound, but I must speak with her, and you must rest, the Duchess insisted. Please, now that you know she is well, return to your quarters and make sure to sleep. Leah hesitated, then curtsied deeply. Before we continue into the story, make us a favor. Hit the subscribe button. This way we will be able to create more audiobooks for free for you. Thank you again. Now, back to our story. I am very sorry for interrupting your conversation, Your Grace, she apologised. As Your Grace pointed out so excellently, I was simply thrilled to know Julie as well. Thank you for having such patience with me. The Duchess smiled gently. Now, Miss Drew, no need to be so formal and no need to apologise. In your position, I would have done precisely the same thing. Now go to bed. You need to sleep. Leah blushed and smiled back. Thank you, Your Grace. Seizing her candle from where she'd put it down and leaving the room, Leah knew that Julie would need to be strong to listen to what the Duchess was about to say. But she also knew that the Duchess did not have a malicious bone in her body, and that after what had happened earlier, her grace would probably make great effort to ensure she did not cause Julie any undue pain. Julie still had to be told that what she had done was wrong, and Julie still needed to be instructed on what to do in the future should she feel the urge to run away. But the Duchess would no doubt speak to Julie as kindly and carefully as Julie needed. Leah had been tempted to remain and eavesdrop, but that plan was somewhat ruined by another presence in the hallway. My Lord! Leah exclaimed in shock, her voice a raised whisper. Shush, the Marquis whispered back. I simply wish to. I merely... It is just that I... Leah stifled a giggle. Was my lord eavesdropping? She asked, still whispering. He blushed. Was my lord seeking a little gossip, perhaps? Leah carried on, somewhat enjoying the awkwardness that was painted across his face. She began to walk towards the staircase, hearing his footsteps softly following her. It is not gossip, he replied. I simply wanted to ensure that you were all well. Leah did not dignify such a blatant lie with a response. Did my lord have any difficulty finding her? she asked instead. He mumbled something under his breath before replying. A little, but in the end she was at her old family home, which made the process much simpler than it might have otherwise been. My lord must have genuinely cared about us to have gone to such great effort to find Julie, Leah said, pausing on the first step and turning around, feeling her heart beating faster and faster. Oh, not at all, he replied, shaking his head and reaching his hand towards the banister in the dark. His hand brushed over hers and she felt a slight shiver of pleasure again at the warmth of his skin. Even despite his journey in the cold, damp night, his hands were so invitingly warm. Leah moved her hand away from his. I am sure my lord does care, Leah replied. No need to pretend that he does anything simply out of duty. My lord went above and beyond his duties to locate Julie and bring her home, perhaps even saving her life. So I refuse to believe your false modesty, or if not modesty, your false bravado when you claim not to care. I suppose you are right. I do care, Leah, he said softly. But I did not do this out of care for Julie, or even for my own mother. 
I care a little about them. I care about you the most, however. You bring me great joy, and I would go to the ends of the earth to make you happy, Leah. Leah felt her face flushing hot. My lord, you should not call me by my Christian name in public. It is very inappropriate. I shall call you what I please, he replied with a smile that was beautifully illuminated by the light of her candle. You are not in public. You are in my home, and it is only the two of us here in this hallway right now. Very well, my lord. If you must use my Christian name, I suppose it does no harm under circumstances such as these, Leah replied. She felt his hand again reaching for the banister. But this time the touch was not accidental. His hand landed directly on top of hers, wrapping around it firmly. His hand felt so big, at least one and a half times the size of hers, and it enveloped her slender fingers completely. She felt the heat rising to her face, but she could not remove her hand. She would not, if she could. Please call me James, the Marquis insisted in a warm whisper. I know you do not wish to do so in public, but just when we two are together, use my name. Whatever my lord says, this situation is far too public for me to use a gentleman's Christian name, Leah whispered back, feeling her heart rattling her chest. What if a servant should overhear us and pass the message on to the Duchess? Then I will tell her the servant lied and have the servant fired, the Marquis replied. And what if the Duchess herself overheard us, my lord? Leah asked. Then I would tell her the truth, that I asked you to call me by my Christian name, Leah, he insisted. Very well, James. Leah felt excited and embarrassed at once. It was not the proper thing to do. A young lady should never refer to a man by his first name in public. Most women even abstained from using their husbands' and their sons' Christian names where possible, instead using their titles. And, like any well-raised young lady, Leah felt an automatic slight shame as she used the Christian name of a high-ranking gentleman who she bore absolutely no relation to at all. But in doing so, she also felt a closeness to this man she had never before experienced. His name felt so nice as it rolled off her tongue and over her lips, and her name sounded so beautiful from his mouth. His hand released hers as she said his name and his grin broadened. I knew it would sound lovely, he said. Unsure what else to say, she smiled, curtsied slightly, and made her way to her room as swiftly as she could, before she felt tempted to do anything even more foolish. Chapter 11 The next morning Julie seemed oddly composed. Leah had not anticipated this much calmness. Although Leah had been excited to see Julie, she had also been exhausted, and after a few minutes of sitting up waiting for her friend, she had fallen asleep from exhaustion. But awaking and looking about the room, Leah quickly realised that Julie was not only up and dressed, but sitting in the armchair in the corner of the room, reading, looking as calm and refreshed as though nothing had happened the night before. You look surprisingly well, Leah said with a smile. I am glad. Julie nodded. I am so sorry for the trouble I caused everyone. I suppose I was not thinking about what I was doing. I should not have caused so much harm, she explained. Leah shook her head. Not at all. You were not prepared for what you heard. Frankly, I am surprised you returned with him, let alone that you are so composed today. He was so gentle and charming, Julie replied with a smile. I felt safe, like I did with my father. I knew then that this place is my home, for now. Why would I have trouble returning home? Julie! Talia exclaimed groggily, awoken by the talking. Talia leapt from her bed and rushed to where Julie was sitting, throwing herself on top of her friend and embracing her tightly. Oh, my dear, dear Julie, you are back! Talia gasped. I was so worried for you. I wept myself to sleep last night. Is this a dream? No, you are quite real. Where were you? Julie blushed. I had returned home, to my old home, she confessed. With a grumble, Agnes opened her eyes and lazily observed the room, as though not quite sure of any of what she was seeing. Julie? I am sorry for any trouble I caused anyone last night, Julie said with a warm smile. I should not have been so inconsiderate. 
quite, Agnes replied with a slight croak to her throat, before reaching for the glass of water at her bedside and taking a small sip. Julie seemed relieved that none of her friends were angry with her. All were their usual selves, and Leah was happy to see this as well. As Leah and Agnes slowly got dressed, Talia remained seated in Julie's lap, both reading the same book, enjoying their closeness to one another. I suppose you have an enunciation lesson this afternoon, Agnes said to Leah, putting on her dress and starting work on the buttons. Now that the Marquis is home, Leah nodded. I suppose I do. You must thank him for finding Julie and bringing her home safely, Agnes replied. Leah felt her face grow warm. Of course. None of the other girls knew of the conversation on the staircase. Only Julie knew she had even seen the Marquis the night before, and she had not said anything. Julie probably wouldn't say anything in the future either. She respected Leah's privacy. So whatever took place under such circumstances was, thankfully, private. The women took turns adjusting one another's lacing at the back and making sure all their hair was neat and professional in appearance. Just because they were no longer ladies of high society, did not mean that they were not to look their very best every single day. And a little effort went a long way. With their perfectly fitted dresses, neatly tied hair and fresh faces, they were a far cry from the glamorous young women they once were. And yet they still looked perfectly decent, respectable and beautiful. Whereas during the earlier days of their sudden impoverishment they had seemed disheveled and genuinely poor, now they were regaining their dignity and grace starting to take the shape their new lives required. I do believe we are more ladylike by the day, Talia said with some pride. We will make excellent governesses, you shall see. And then, I do not know what then, but think of the possibilities. Julie nodded and looked at her reflection in the dressing table mirror. Although I suppose I shall leave the powders and tints to the finer and more common ladies. It did not really suit me, did it? There is nothing in which you do not look beautiful, Talia replied. But you look so much more beautiful when you are true to yourself. Agnes sighed a little. If only this were my own self, perhaps I would then be happy, she protested. I am not sure this suits me one bit. It does not, Talia confessed. But I am sure we shall all find our new places in this world. Truth be told, Leah was beginning to appreciate her new situation. Whereas Talia had always embraced it, and Julie and Agnes were still unsure of where their lives were headed, Leah was now falling into her role. Although life was more limited than before, it was also, in some ways, more flexible. It was true she could not go out and do as she pleased, and she also lacked that support she had loved so much. But for the first time in her life, she did not need to fret about the details of how she dressed or what she said. She no longer needed to worry about courting and marriage prospects. She no longer bore the weight of an entire estate on her shoulders. The price she had to pay was the only thing she regretted. Sharing this freedom with her beloved father would have made it perfect. Are we any the wiser as to what the Annunciation lessons are about? Talia asked as Leah sat down, and Talia began brushing her hair. Not an ounce, Leah lied. I do believe he does it only because he can. As another means of tormenting us? Agnes asked. I would not be surprised. He was not too cruel to you last night, was he, Julie dear? He was most kind, actually, Julie replied. I do believe he has a heart under his brusque exterior, but his pride prevents him from showing it. Agnes rolled her eyes. Surely that makes his behaviour all the more ridiculous. What sort of a man takes pride in being so obnoxious to people simply because he believes he is above them? Leah nodded. I agree. Why should he devote himself so much to creating an impression of wickedness? Agnes shook her head. It sounds awfully suspicious. I could say a hundred things which might be causing his behaviour, but I do not wish to say anything prematurely. There must be a good reason. Or not, Talia replied. Perhaps it is simply his idea of entertainment. Agnes scoffed. 
I should hope that a man of his education, status and wealth has more ways of entertaining himself than taking a young woman under his care to mock her accent. I am sure he does, Leah replied. Does he not call you Leah? Julie asked. I do find that odd. He calls the rest of us by our family names, Miss Lily, Miss Hubbard and Miss Smith. Well, that is most ridiculous, Agnes replied. Surely he does not... He does, Leah interrupted. He insists upon calling me by my Christian name. Whatever for? Talia asked. To mock you more? I do not know, Leah replied, hoping she would not be caught lying again. He called me Miss Lily the whole ride home, Julie replied. Never once did he use my Christian name. He has never called me by mine either, Talia said, not in private or in public. I would not stand for it were I you, Agnes said. It feels too much as though he is disrespecting you. Talia nodded eagerly. It does. Marquis or not, a gentleman needs to respect a lady. And that he only does it to you, when he believes nobody is observing him, says he knows full well that what he is doing is insulting and inappropriate. Ought I to ask him to stop? Leah asked. Of course, Agnes insisted. Even if he will not respect you, you ought to respect yourself. Not asking him to stop is essentially the same as telling him you are not a lady and inviting all sorts of future disrespect. Then I shall, Leah replied. Thank you all for offering such wise advice. Well, it is not as though you may call him by his first name, Talia said with a slight scoff, although he says he does not believe in courtesy titles. Julie laughed a little. Can you imagine? In fact, I am not sure I have even heard his name. I wonder what it is. It is James, I believe, Agnes replied. She giggled a bit too. Imagine calling a Marquis James. Leah felt a little uncomfortable. Wasn't that precisely what she had done the night before? Although I suppose if I were calling him by his Christian name as well, it would be a bit more even, considering he is using mine. Julie shook her head a little. No, that could never do, Leah. Even I know that. Julie is right. That would be even more inappropriate, Agnes exclaimed. That is something to be done between husband and wife, and in private at that. You would not call your husband by his first name in public? Talia asked. Of course not, Agnes replied with a slight huff. Any man I wed would need to be a titled gentleman, and whoever heard of a titled gentleman being called Bertie by his wife in public? I want a man I can call sweet things in public, Talia replied. My mother used to call my father darling before they died. I'd like to do the same to my husband. What about you, Julie? I am not sure. I tend to agree with Agnes, Julie replied. If a man has any status, he ought to be referred to properly. Leah felt her heart thumping harder than ever. But they were right. Her friends could see the forest that Leah had missed for the trees. It was not simply a matter of her feeling uncomfortable. It was a matter of propriety, a matter of power and status. He did not have a right to disrespect her, nor to demand intimacy of her. However attractive he was, however much she enjoyed his presence, he was doing things that no self-respecting woman would allow. And, as a self-respecting woman, Leah had to stop allowing it. Stop him before he started acting more and more inappropriately, putting her in a precarious situation. She did not want to end the lessons. She enjoyed his company very much. But her feelings did not come into it. She could enjoy his company every single day, but she still needed to draw the line. As she sat through her morning music lessons and then performed posture-improving exercise, she wondered what she could say to him, how she could begin to explain it. After all, the demands he was making were not so severe. But he had to understand that they were the first step on a ladder of increasingly inappropriate demands, the likes of which usually left a woman destitute or, worse yet, ruined. Walking into the library, she steeled herself to face him. He looked so calm and relaxed, she already felt bad for ruining his peace. I must decline any further enunciation lessons, Leah said avoiding eye contact. And I am sure you are perfectly aware of the reason. 
The Marquis sat up immediately. What? Why? We are both deriving great benefit from them, are we not? And I know for a fact that you find pleasure in my company. We do, and I do, Leia replied. But I am afraid that we are falling into the trap of becoming far too familiar with one another, and this is a relationship which cannot but end poorly. Nonsense, he replied. We are no more familiar than brother and sister. Which is much too familiar for a host and his guest, Leah replied. You need not call me James, if that is bothering you, but I insist that you continue to read to me, the Marquis said. It is not simply a matter of using our Christian names, Leah said sternly. The whole relationship, the entire dynamic, is one that will simply scale and scale until it reaches a point where it must all come tumbling down, leaving us both in a terrible situation. I am a Marquis, Leah, he replied. I can do as I please, and using our Christian names in private is far from a problem. Who would ever confront us over it? What could anyone do? But you are a young, unwed man, and I am to become a governess and leave, she insisted. Indeed, then, how much time do we truly have to become too intimate? I am sure the benefits of these classes outweigh the cost. He smirked. Leah hesitated. She knew she ought to turn about and leave, but she could not. She sat down on her chair. What book shall I be reading today? Chapter 12 Leah was not sure how appropriate the Marquis could be after pushing so many boundaries, but she gave him an opportunity to redeem himself. She knew full well that the only reason she gave him this opportunity was because she was harbouring extremely inappropriate feelings for him. And yet he was correct. They would not have enough time together for it to go any further. It could be their guilty pleasure. What harm could it do? Besides, it was not as though they had anywhere else to go or anything else to do. She needed to complete her education. He was all but forced to live with his mother until he married. She had no friends besides the three she had arrived with. His friends had all left for bigger cities, where they led obscenely opulent lives, and he had no suitors on account of neither of his parents being particularly concerned with marrying him off soon. They were both trapped in the building with not much better to do, and they both benefited from the interactions they had on many levels. All they needed to do was continue to keep the interactions exactly as they were. As the weeks and months passed, Leah was surprised by how well the Marquis kept his boundaries. He respected her privacy and called her Miss Drew at all times. He told her of his hopes and dreams, his concerns and his childhood antics, but never once asked her for intimate details of herself. No, she gave those freely. Although the Marquis kept his distance, she found it painfully difficult to keep hers. She found him too attractive, too good to resist. She knew that this was also good cause for ending the lessons. Her breaking boundaries was no better than him breaking them but she put it to the back of her mind. At least he was not putting any pressure on her to tell him these things. In some sense, she was saddened by this as well. She had tender feelings for this handsome man, or at least for the man he became behind closed doors, and knowing that all it took to push him away was a few choice words. That hurt. That showed precisely how vague their connection was, precisely how little she mattered to him on a deeper level on the level that counted. It was a chilling reminder of the inappropriateness of the entire situation, of how badly things would have gone for her had she grown to love him. Their relationship was just as close as it could afford to be, and she was grateful for that distance, even though it hurt her heart very much. Leah was very grateful when the day came that the Duchess called the four friends into her office. She knew this would mark the end of their stay there, and she knew that the Marquis would not be able to go against his mother's wishes. Finally, Leah would be free in yet another sense, free of the oppressive weight of her ever-growing affection for a man she could never belong to. The office was as stern and immaculate as any gentleman's office. In fact, were the Duke himself seated behind the desk, he would not have looked out of place. The Duchess insisted on carrying herself with the dignity and professionalism of any highly successful business owner and charitable soul, male or female. 
As the girl sat down on the settee which faced the desk, Leah could feel the air brimming with excitement, so much so that her hairs stood on end from the intense energy of the room. Good afternoon, ladies, the Duchess said. Good afternoon, Your Grace, the young women replied. Now we all knew this day would come. I do believe you will be ready to depart and begin your work as governesses. With one exception, the Duchess explained. Miss Lily, you must remain. Julie looked a little surprised and turned to face Talia. With all due respect, Your Grace, why might Julie not leave to become a governess? Talia asked. She is yet to learn all that she needs to know in order to carry herself properly in high society, the Duchess replied. Although there are some employers who could teach her these lessons, none are at present available, and so she must wait until she is prepared, or until someone willing to educate her becomes available. Talia nodded, seeming a touch saddened by the fact that Julie would have to remain. She would not contest the Duchess's judgment. All of the young women glanced to Julie. Leah wondered how painful it must be to be told that you are not yet considered an adult by the person in charge of your care. But if anything, Julie seemed relieved that she was not yet expected to depart. She knew as well as anyone else she was not ready. She bowed her head, but smiled gently. She was more than willing to wait and learn more before she left. Your Grace, does this mean that our respective households have already been assigned? Agnes asked. Indeed they have, but our work is not yet complete, the Duchess replied. I shall be sending a letter to each household, confirming who it is that they shall be receiving. Unless they have any objections, I shall then ensure that you are equipped for your journeys, and you shall depart with a certificate confirming you have been educated here, as well as a personal letter of recommendation from myself. Is there anything we must do, Your Grace? Agnes pressed always eager to do the most she possibly could to secure her opportunities. I urge you to write your letters and advertise your services well, the Duchess insisted. I shall speak with you all later and compose my letter of recommendation based on your own letters, so that there is some consistency between the aspects of yourselves which you take pride in and the aspects which I highlight. The young women all nodded and then glanced to one another. The tension in the room far from collapsing was only increasing. They were finally going to depart, to find their first source of employment in their entire lives, and they felt at once entirely prepared and wholly clueless. Leah felt a little saddened that this period in her life was coming to a close, not least of all because she did not know what awaited. As they were dismissed from the office, she looked at her friends, realising that unlike the last big change in her life, this time nobody would accompany her. Her friends had been at many points the only thing that had allowed her to compose herself, the only people who had given her the power and the tools which she required in order to carry on. And they would not be there this time. This time it would be her, on her own, with a bag and a letter, in a strange house, probably days, if not weeks, away from anyone she knew. I am scared. Leah confessed as they shut the door to their quarters. I cannot do this again. I cannot leave a home and a family behind yet again. For you are my family. But we had not known what awaited us when that horrible news reached us, Talia insisted. At least this change is on our own terms. But is it? Leah asked back, feeling her heart throbbing painfully. We are leaving because we have been asked to work because we cannot earn our keep by any other means than the sweat off our brows, and we are being forcibly separated. We are prepared, Agnes replied, and none of us is disappearing forevermore. We shall still have one another whenever needed. I just wanted a home, somewhere to go back to, Leah said, her voice trembling, and now the only home I have left is sending me away. But you will have somewhere to come back to. And not only will Her Grace find us all positions, but she will welcome you all back should you need a place to stay, Julie said with a smile. And I will be here as well. I will be here for all of you should you need me. Leah sat on her bed, feeling a warm tear falling down her cheek. She had been so strong for so long, she had held it together for all of her friends. And now she realised 
that they had been holding her up as much as she had been holding them up. She needed them. Julie sat down beside Leah and kissed her cheek softly. You are the strongest woman I have ever met, and you have given me the strength to overcome my fears. Please, let me give you the strength to overcome yours. Leah held Julie's hand as the other two joined them on the edge of the bed. Agnes embraced Julie. I suppose now is as good a time as any to apologise. I am so sorry that I have been so inconsiderate towards you. You are a brave, bold, wonderful young lady. And I am sorry if at times I am rude to you, Talia said, making eye contact with Agnes. I know that you do not mean anything in the way you are, and the strength of your character, the values you uphold with such dignity, have taught me very much how to be a lady. I might have scoffed at some of your propriety, but it has taught me so much, so never think that I did not value it. We have all had some difficulty with the changes we have faced, Leah said, and we have all learned from one another, and learned in supporting one another. I am simply glad to have had you as friends through it all. And you shall continue to have us. We shall continue to have one another, Julie insisted. We have much yet to learn from this world and from each other, and nothing can ever come between a friendship like ours. I wonder what sort of family we shall be governesses to, Talia mused, especially Agnes. I cannot imagine you would enjoy being a governess to someone who was once beneath you. Agnes shuddered a little. If that is my burden to bear, then I shall bear it. However, I too hope that I would at least be a governess to a higher class family, a family that understands and respects me in turn. I am sure that Her Grace will consider that need when assigning me a household. I hope to go to a family that is not quite so high class, that is not too focused on propriety, Talia said. I could not bear to wear a uniform and follow rules all day. I would like to sit in the sun, out in a garden, enjoying teaching the children. And you, Leah? Leah contemplated the question a little. I do not mind where I go so long as it is a family that needs me, she replied. I would like to think that I am being good and helpful to someone by working for them, and that I am appreciated and valued wherever I am. Agnes nodded. I can agree with that. I don't think any of us could bear to work for someone who does not show us respect and treat us fairly. But to be treated like that, we need to do our jobs well, Julie mused. I have no doubt in my mind that we shall all do very well indeed, Leah said, and she felt sure of it. Chapter 13 That afternoon, her enunciation lesson with the Marquis felt strained. Leah knew full well why. He must have heard from his mother that Leah and her friends would be leaving, and this was making him uncomfortable. He wanted to talk to her about it, but he wasn't supposed to know, or he didn't know if he was supposed to know. Rather than talk to her as soon as she walked into the library, he lay back and handed her the book. And rather than hang off her every word, he stared mournfully at the ceiling as she read, sighing from time to time as though he were running out of air. What is the matter, my lord? Leah asked, giving in and inviting him to talk. It is such a pity that you will have to leave, the Marquis said with yet another dramatic sigh. I shall miss these lessons, Miss Drew. I know you shall, my lord, she replied, and I shall miss them also. But this is not my job, and I must leave to earn my keep elsewhere. His head turned so he was facing her, gazing at her with soft, sad eyes. He sighed again. I wish it were not so, he said in a deep whisper. We both knew that this day would eventually come, Leah said, trying to reason both with him and with her own heart. Come, I wish to walk with you in the gardens, he said. It was a command, not a request, as he stood up suddenly and held out his hand. Leah hesitated then reached out her hand and allowed him to help her to her feet. His hand felt so warm, so big, and so strong. She did not let it go for a few seconds, instead looking at his strong yet finely formed fingers against the paleness of her own soft skin. Soon her skin would be rougher than his, 
built up from hour after hour of hard, honest work. She did not like that idea, but she accepted it. Come, let us go, he said, snapping her out of her thoughts and walking towards the door, still holding her hand. To avoid shame, she reluctantly pulled her fingers away from his as they exited into the hallway. Her hand felt empty where his had been. The garden air was refreshing, although the autumn wind was beginning to bite sharply. Leah shivered a little, but the Marquis did not offer to return. He slipped his coat off his shoulders and draped it gently over hers, before offering his arm for her to hold, to support her and guide her as they walked on the uneven, damp lawn. For the first few minutes they were quiet, enjoying one another's company, and Leah wondered whether that was his only reason for requesting the walk. But then he cleared his throat and began to explain. I needed to speak with you away from my mother's ears, the Marquis said. Just the two of us for a moment. Your mo... Her grace would not have known had we spoken in the room she was not there, Leah replied. My mother has more ears than the two either side of her head, and anything we say within those walls would eventually make its way back to her, the Marquis said. I could not afford to risk that. We are only truly in private out here where nobody can hear us. Leah hesitated, then nodded. And yet what is so terribly important, my lord, that you cannot bear for her grace to hear it? What is so shameful that my lord would tell me and not her? I want you to stay, he said, his voice shaking a little. I want you to say you are not yet ready and stay behind with Miss Lily. Leah felt her breath hitch and her heart nearly stop. I beg your pardon, my lord. I want you to ask to remain. Tell my mother that you are afraid you will not do a good job, that you still have much to learn, that you need more time and space before you can possibly contemplate working for anyone else he explained in a slight frenzy. Perhaps even request to work here, as a teacher, to improve your skills before you are ready to be a governess. Say that you are worried for Julie. Anything. I am sorry, my lord, Leah said, feeling a pain in her chest, but that would be nothing but a lie. Then lie, he replied. Lie for me. Say whatever it takes to keep you here. Say you're not educated enough, you're scared, you're confused. Pretend that your manners have deteriorated. Say you fell ill. Leah pulled her hand roughly off the Marquis's arm and glared at him indignantly. My lord, I will not. How dare you ask me to insult the kindness of your mother, the Duchess of Devon, and the skills and intellect of the teachers she chose to watch over me by declaring their efforts insufficient and attempting to fool them. Would you not go that far for me? He asked tentatively. Of course not. Leah replied. In fact, I do not believe I could ever do anything for a man who asked me to do something so horrible. Why would you suggest such things? Because I need you to stay here with me, Miss Drew. I need you to stay and talk to me and read to me, he insisted. And yet that is as indecent a proposition as I have ever been made, Leah replied. I cannot devote my life to conversing intimately with a man who shall never become my husband. He sighed heavily and looked up at the heavens, as though overwhelmed with despair. Leah, what would it take to convince you of my good intentions? Now at the bottom of the garden, Leah could hear the intensity of emotion in his voice, and it unnerved her more than a little. Nothing, nothing at all, she replied, because you have no good intentions. You are thinking only of yourself, of what you enjoy from our relationship. Have you not considered what it might be doing to me? What it could do to her grace, the poor woman, should she find out what you have been doing and saying? Well, I suppose you have thought of it, at least as much as you needed in order to realise it must be kept secret from her. The Marquis turned around with such fire in his eyes that it made Leah jump back a little, her knees weak, her heart pounding relentlessly. She tried telling herself he meant no harm, that a man of his dignity and position would not attempt to hurt her. But he was a man nonetheless, and she was a young woman, alone with him, well out of sight of the school windows. He stepped forward, eyes still passionate, locked with hers, and reached out, placing one hand firmly on her arm. She wondered whether, if she pulled away, 
he would let her go or simply grip her tighter. She gasped a little at how strong his grip was and looked up into his eyes desperately. But he did not soften. He just stared down at her. He looked like a hungry wolf atop its prey. A wicked thought in the back of her mind told her to kiss him, to grab him and embrace him and encourage him to ravish her there and then. But her more rational side was deeply afraid of the same thing taking place. Or even worse, that she might lose control, kiss him, only to be rejected. At least if he ravished her right now, all the blame would be on him, all the shame would be his. If she invited him, then it would be shared guilt. But if she kissed him and he turned away, then how much shame would she feel? Not that anyone would ever need to know. Perhaps we ought to return to the school, Leah suggested, feeling a slight panic and a slight thrill at once as she realised how alone they were together. She could feel her face growing hot as she looked up at him. He stepped in even closer, his chest almost touching hers, her looking up into his eyes, him gazing down into hers with indescribable hunger. Leah knew she ought to slap him, to cough indignantly, to pull her arm out of his slowly relaxing grip, to shout for help and run, to do anything at all to preserve her dignity. Looking at the school out of the corner of her eye, she could only see a sliver of wall through the trees. No doubt they were invisible to anyone in the building. She smiled softly. He looked so handsome, so perfect. Miss Drew, do not do this to me. I need your company and your tenderness. I need you, he said. I do believe I am growing to love you. To love you in a way I have never loved a woman before. And if I cannot call you by your name or hold you in my arms, at least do not deprive me of the sweetness of your voice, the warmth of your company, the friendship of your ears and the wisdom of your words. At least allow me those simple things as a friend to me. I need you. I crave you day and night. Leah breathed deeply to calm herself as much as possible before shaking her head sternly. I cannot remain for that very reason, she said. It would be a temptation to us both. Nonsense, he said, his eyes falling sadly, his hand releasing her arm. Were you as in love with me as I am with you, you would never let me suffer like this. I cannot believe that you feel a thing for me but pity and disgust. That is not true, Leah replied and you know it is not. Were I disgusted in you, would I be here in the garden with you? And how can a woman pity a man who has a thousand times what she ever has possessed, and a million times what she ever will possess again? I have made every effort to be with you without compromising my own dignity, every effort to give us both that sweet taste of each other's company without losing ourselves, and this is how you repay me. It was clear he was heartbroken. His face fell, and when he glanced up at her again, his eyes were soft with sorrow. He sighed heavily. Is there nothing I can say? he asked. Nothing at all that would persuade you to remain? I have considered remaining already, Leah replied, and I have decided against it for this reason, among many others. If you truly wished to remain, you would have found a way, he said bitterly. Leah found tears welling up in her eyes. Please do not make this so difficult, she pleaded. We both know that this will not end well, whether I go for work or whether I remain here for your sake. He hesitated and looked up at the school. I wish we could have met under better circumstances, he finally said. I wish I could have met you before your father passed away, when I might have been given the opportunity to court you. I am sure I would have found you equally as charming then. And I am sure I would have found you charming also, Leah replied, drawing a deep breath to steady herself. But to speak of what might have been only rub salt in the wounds. He nodded sternly. I am so sorry that I toyed with your heart, Miss Drew. I promise to be a friend to you in every way I can. You promise, my lord? Leah asked softly. He nodded again. I do. I want to have you in my life, Miss Drew at any cost necessary. And if you must remain as a friend, who lives a week away and sends me a letter once a month, that will be good enough for me. Far, far better than nothing. I promise to write to you more often than once a month, Leah said with a forced chuckle. Do you promise to write back? 
Leah was taken aback by the Marquis's strong arms embracing her, pressing her head against his firm chest so she could hear his heart beating fast. I promise, Leah, he whispered into her ear. Chapter 14 Leah had thought this was the last she would hear of her departure for another week at least, so it took her by surprise when two days later the Duchess sent her a letter by means of a servant. Apparently the letter describing Leah to her new prospective employers, the Duke and Duchess of Lancaster, had arrived and immediately been replied to. They were in urgent need of a governess for their young teenage daughter, who was ready to learn all the essentials of high society and courtship, ready to be presented at court and hopefully engaged to be married by age 19 or 20. It would be a lot of work, and Leah was sorely needed. I have already received a reply, Leah said, walking into the girls' quarters and brandishing her letter. I shall work for the Duke and Duchess of Lancaster. I have one also, Talia said, opening her envelope and scrutinising her letter. From Lord and Lady Elridge, they have accepted me. I wonder if Agnes has received hers yet. Glancing at Agnes's bed, Leah nodded sharply towards the little white square which rested there. It looks as though she has. Well, we all know Agnes has been accepted. Who would reject a woman of such grace, education and finery? Talia asked. I am most certain that the only person snobbish enough to reject Agnes would be Agnes, Julie said with a chuckle. Just then Agnes walked in, causing them all to blush apologetically, hoping she had not heard them poking fun at her. She instantly spied the other girl's letters and made a beeline for hers on her bed. Agnes read hers with a stern expression and then just nodded slightly in the other women's direction. Whatever her destination, it was a secret. I suppose I ought to start packing, Talia said. It asks me to attend immediately. Apparently their last governess is leaving in a bit of a huff. Leah nodded. Mine also says they will be needing me soon, so I'm assuming her grace will be preparing for our departures already. Julie sat on the edge of her bed and stared with a slight pout. I will miss you all very much. Make sure to write to me. Talia sat beside Julie and held her hand firmly. Of course I shall write to you. In fact, I shall write to you all and tell you all about what I am doing, and I shall return to visit you and see you every single month, for I shall not be far from here. She pressed her lips to Julie's forehead. I shall make sure to write to you as soon as I can with a post office address, Agnes replied. Must you be so secretive? Talia asked with a raised eyebrow. Agnes merely shrugged. It is none of your business who I shall work for, but I shall make every effort to remain in contact with all of you. Leah smiled. That was so... Agnes. She sat down on the edge of Julie's bed and embraced Julie. We all love you very much, and we shall write and visit as often as is possible. Julie sighed a little. I know. It simply feels a touch frustrating. It is not fair that whilst you are off on your way to have some new adventure, I shall be cooped up in here without any friends. Julie. Talia replied sternly. Wherever you are, you must make friends, even here. You are a bright and charming young lady, and I have no doubt that you will make many, many friends in this school. The young women spent a moment in silence together, taking in the magnitude of what was about to happen to them all. Julie still had lessons on etiquette to attend, and she soon set off, promising to see her friends before they left that afternoon. Meanwhile, the others had to prepare their bags for the coachman to load into the carriages so that they could be taken to their respective destinations. Packing her dresses away neatly, Leah realised just how many things she had brought with her from her old home, and just how few she had used. She had no need for most of these things, and if she still did not use them as a governess, she planned on giving them away to the needy. I would like a walk, Talia said suddenly interrupting the silent sorting, standing and straightening her skirts. The day is too lovely to waste, is it not? We do not get many like this. It is a lovely day, but shouldn't we pack our bags properly first? Leah asked. Talia shrugged. I already have. 
Glancing over, Leah saw that Talia had indeed thrown all her possessions untidily into her three bags, forcibly closing them so that they bulged in an unsightly manner. When Leah raised an eyebrow, Talia simply shrugged. I will need to unpack them and tidy them when I get there. I do not see the point in doing it twice, Talia said as she walked out of the room. See you in a while. At least you will keep me company as I pack, Leah said with a slight chuckle as the door closed and Talia's footsteps skipped down the hall, making a most unladylike sound. I am sorry, Agnes replied. I actually would like to speak to the Duchess about... a matter. Oh, Leah replied, not able to conceal her disappointment. Perhaps I can come along. Agnes shook her head. It is private. But we shall have some time together before we leave this afternoon, I promise. Placing a gently folded dress into her case, Agnes stood up, seized her letter, and made her way out of the room. Leah felt upset enough. She could almost cry. It was to be their last day together in a long time, and they were not going to spend all of it together. If she could, she would have seized every last minute in her friend's company. It seemed they did not agree with her when it came to the magnitude of their situation. But at least with the room empty she could focus on packing her belongings. It all felt so sudden. She had expected another week to pass, at the very least, before they would end up separated. She had thought they would have more time to adjust to this discovery, more time together, more time for laughing and talking and embracing one another. They were like sisters to her. In a sense, she was losing another family. She was also losing another home. It would be sad to leave behind the place she had known as home for several months. It had not been long, but much had happened. These walls had embraced her when nowhere else would have her. The Duchess had kept her warm and fed when nobody else could. Her friends had been there for her when there was nothing else to give her strength. In a way, Leah would be walking out of the Duchess of Dorset's school for noble women as a much different person than when she had walked in. It was her home only her second home of a lifetime. And although it had been a painful episode of her life, it had been hers nonetheless. She would miss it dearly. As the door creaked open, Leah thought nothing of it. It was probably Agnes, returned from seeing the Duchess. Only Agnes would walk in unannounced and silently like that. Back so soon, Agnes, Leah asked, gently folding yet another blouse she had never had a chance to wear. I trust that whatever you discussed with the Duchess was most private and secret, never to be heard by my ears. I would not know, the Marquis's voice replied. I am not Agnes. Spinning around, Leah stared at the Marquis incredulously for a moment. He was grinning at her like a mischievous boy caught writing love notes to girls in church. My lord, that is most inappropriate, Leah exclaimed. You cannot enter a lady's room without an escort, without announcing yourself. Please leave immediately. This is not a lady's room, he replied. You will not sleep here tonight, nor will any of your friends. Even Julie, who shall stay, will be moved to quarters with some of the older students, so that she is not alone. Therefore this is simply a room, and a room in my home, moreover. So, in summation, I think I shall stay. Leah glared at him a little earning herself another roguish grin as he collapsed into the armchair in the corner of the room. But she could not help but smile back a little, humoured by his defiance. I had not expected it to be so soon, he lamented. I thought there would be more time for us to spend together before you departed. Leah nodded. I understand. I had not thought it would be so soon either, she replied. I believed I would have more time to enjoy this place, more time with my friends here. I shall miss them very much. Am I one of those friends who you shall miss? The Marquis asked tentatively. Shall you miss me very much? Leah felt her cheeks growing hot and averted her gaze, returning to her task of folding clothes with shaking hands. Of course I shall, my lord. Please stay here with me, he pleaded. I cannot bear the thought of you leaving. It is not up to me, my lord, but to her grace's choice and my accepting it, Leah said. I cannot stay, for it would ruin us both. 
You would not be ruined, he countered. I would not lay a finger on a single hair of your head if you do not wish for it. However much I long for you, I can be a gentleman. After all, have you not seen how kind and respectful I have been towards you these past weeks, Miss Drew? In fact, I do not believe I have said or done a single inappropriate thing since you asked me to treat our relationship more formally. Before we continue into the story, make us a favor. Hit the subscribe button. This way we will be able to create more audiobooks for free for you. Thank you again. Now, back to our story. And yet I have, Leah replied. I could not help myself. And I am supposed to be held responsible for your failure to keep up your part of the deal, he replied indignantly. Leah shook her head. It is impossible for our feelings for one another to be appropriate. Not unless we were married. As things stand, it is too much. I have tried and tried again to hold myself back, but I feel too strongly towards you. It is for the best this way. The Marquis fell silent, causing Leah to turn around and look at him. His eyes were fixated on the window, gazing thoughtfully out at the tumbling clouds in the grey sky. Leah wanted to return to her packing, but could not tear her eyes away from him. He was too charming, too handsome, and the air of power and mystery around him at that moment was too much to bear. His expression changed, turning suddenly colder. Very well, he finally said. If that is what you truly wish, then so be it. Leah smiled and nodded. Thank you, my lord, she replied. But he did not smile back. He stood up and straightened his coat a little, avoiding making eye contact with her. He drew a deep breath, sighed, and marched right out the door without so much as uttering goodbye. Leah felt frozen to the spot. What was that? Had he just rejected her? Had she rejected him? Were they no longer friends? It made no sense for him to go from so needy to so distant in a matter of seconds. Did he not care for her after all? Suddenly Leah realised her cheeks were wet. Chapter 15 The room felt so much emptier now he had left, so much more than it had felt before he entered. She wanted him to come back in, so she could embrace him and apologise for offending him and beg him to be her friend again. But that was precisely why she should remain in the room rather than seek him. After all, if he could not be her friend unless she remained by his side, if he could not endure separation that was vitally necessary, then what sort of a friend could he ever be to her? Hearing the door open again, her breath hitched. It was Talia. Although she walked in looking refreshed, Talia's expression soon changed when she saw Leah. What is the matter? she asked. Leah wanted to tell her friend everything. To break down and confess to her love for the Marquis, the peculiar nature of their relationship, the impossibility of their love, and his cruel rejection mere minutes earlier. But she was also deeply ashamed of it all. It would be so horribly embarrassing to confess to falling for the Marquis, to confess to tolerating his behaviour especially after she was warned against it. And besides, what could Talia or any other of her friends do to help her? He was his own man, she was her own woman, she had to leave. I will simply miss the school, Leah said. I will miss it here as well, Talia said. But think of the opportunities that await us beyond our education here. Employment, marriage, a new future. Leah hesitated. Yes, marriage. One day she would probably marry, most likely another higher-ranking servant, someone equal to herself, or if she was lucky, a pastor or a doctor. Leah nodded. Yes, we have so many possibilities ahead of us. Exactly. We cannot remain stuck in the past. What would there be for us here? Our education is complete. There is no work available here. Can you imagine staying at the school without any opportunities for work or marriage for the rest of our days? Talia elaborated. As Talia picked up her first bag, Leah felt the weight in her chest growing. Marriage. It would be nice, but all she could feel right now was sadness at losing the Marquis. And it wasn't only about status. 
How could she bear the thought of marrying anyone who she felt anything less for? Finishing packing her bag and closing it, Leah wondered if she could ever love someone as she loved him. After all, this was an emotion she had never experienced before, a love beyond her wildest imagination. Was it even possible to feel this for someone else? Or was this her one chance at romance, her soulmate, thwarted by the cruel realities of a fate that wanted to torment her endlessly? Leah sighed as she looked down at her two bags. Soon they and she would be gone, and she would no longer even be able to worry about such matters. I think we ought to go for lunch, Talia said with a smile. Julie and Agnes will be there too. Leah felt her heart leap a little, and perhaps, just perhaps, the Marquis would be there also. How wonderful that would be. She tried to rein in her excitement and just smiled back at Talia. That is a wonderful idea. We really ought to spend the remaining hours together. It may be the last time we are all together in months. Talia laughed a little. I should hope not but we definitely need to make use of this time together. I am sure they will be there already. Talia was right. Just as they approached the dining room, they saw Julie and Agnes walking towards it as well. Both seemed happy, almost as though they had forgotten that these would be the last hours spent together in months. Leah was no longer sure whether it was her friends who were oblivious to the sands of time quickly slipping out of their hourglass, coming to the end of their time at the school together or whether it was her who was overreacting, and it truly was not so terrible. After all, much as the other girls insisted, they would write to one another and meet again soon. It would not be too long before they were together again. But even happily chatting to her friends, Leah could scarcely eat. Someone was still on her mind. Normally the Marquis would look in on them as they had dinner, but he was nowhere to be found. She enjoyed the company of her friends, but it made her heart ache to think that this friend in particular was not looking to spend any more time with her. She felt rejected, desolate, used. She wondered if his love had ever been real, or if he had been leading her on, with hopes of obtaining something else from her. Something much less friendly, sweet, and innocent than he had made himself appear during their lessons. Her heart ached at the thought that she might have been deceived, they did not have an afternoon enunciation lesson. Although she was leaving after it would have ended, so there was not much of a point to any lessons. Instead, the girls were encouraged to spend some time together. And yet, as the others sat down in the drawing room for a last cup of tea before their carriages were loaded, Leah found herself making an excuse to leave for a few minutes, to find him. Walking down the hall, she knew that there would be no lesson and yet her feet took her directly towards the library. What for? After all, if there was no lesson, then not only did she not have to attend, but he did not. Why would he be there if he did not have to be? But perhaps the Marquis would be there after all. Perhaps he was drawn to the library just as she was. Leah made her way towards the library, finding the door open. But inside were some other students and nobody else. Not wanting to look ridiculous, and secretly hoping to find him inside, she wandered into the library, up and down the two rows of books and around the tables. He was most definitely not there. She spied his usual favourite poetry book on the shelf and took it down, opening it and leafing through its pages. She was tempted to take it with her. But no, it was his. And he would no doubt look for it. Like the Marquis, the book that reminded her of him had to remain. Was he purposefully avoiding her? Leah walked through the halls looking left and right. No, that could not be. He was simply busy. He was a marquis after all. A marquis with an honorary title, with no duties whatsoever, who did not even need to study, and was not allowed to attend events. He was not busy. Not with anything important, of course. He was probably just idling away the hours but that didn't mean he wasn't distracted. Perhaps he had forgotten what time it was, fallen asleep, or got immersed in a book. Perhaps he wanted to bid her farewell, but circumstances beyond his control had stopped him from doing so. Walking past the door to the patio, she noticed some movement at the far edge of the garden. 
the garden, of course. She made her way swiftly down the steps, feeling the warm sun and cool breeze battling on her bare arms. Looking up and down the lawn, she did not see anyone. She could have sworn she saw him walking over there, though. Or perhaps it was simply a bird that caught her eye. Or one of the cats the maids kept in the scullery. But just to make sure, Leah walked down the garden, towards the trees where he usually liked to walk and rest and watch the birds and flowers. On her way down, she heard a noise behind her, higher up the garden. Turning about, Leah saw a man's back as he walked up towards the open patio doors. There he was. She smiled in relief. My lord, she exclaimed, trying to be loud enough to be heard, but not to cause a scene. He did not turn. Lord Salisbury, Leah exclaimed again, swiftly walking. Up the garden, holding her skirts lightly, trying to catch up with him. He looked over his shoulder slightly, then without stopping or making eye contact with her, looked dead ahead and swiftly marched up the remaining steps and into the house, gently closing the patio doors behind himself. Leah stood, dumbfounded, and looked at the door, wondering what on earth had happened there and where he had gone. She had not believed he was avoiding her, but now she was second-guessing herself. Surely he had heard her calling him. Of course he had. He had stopped and listened. He had turned slightly, probably seen her out of the corner of his eye. And yet he had rushed indoors, without even acknowledging her. With a deep sigh, she walked up the steps and opened the door. He had already disappeared, probably in a hurry to exit the hallway and go and hide from her somewhere else. He did not even dare face her. She didn't even feel any pain upon realising this. She was simply numb. At least now she had her answer. Now she knew how little she truly meant to him. It had seemed so wonderful, but it had been a hollow relationship. No wonder he had no trouble behaving himself, whereas she struggled. She loved him. He clearly did not love her as much. Leah understood it, of course. He was in pain, rejected, heartbroken. But so was she. And the least he could do was bid her farewell. Even if he did not love her truly, at least he could acknowledge her love and treat her with some respect, allow her to salve the wounds on her heart by seeing her leave and writing to her as he had promised. She had thought they would at the very least have that sort of relationship, as brother and sister. She had thought he cared for her on some deeper level. But now it seemed that they could not even be friends. She knew she needed to be strong, but she didn't feel very strong. She wasn't sure how life could be so horribly cruel as to allow her to fall in love with a man who would treat her so awfully. Wandering almost aimlessly, she looked about, taking in the sights of the school one last time. The rooms where their lessons had been held. The gymnasium where they had been taught proper posture and various European dances. The drawing room where they had enjoyed tea with the Duchess. The other girls were no longer there. But Leah carried on walking, wondering when she would next see this place again, and if it could ever mean the same to her after the Marquis. Her feet took her up to the room that had once been hers and her friends. Just as the Marquis had said, now it was bare. It was not their room anymore. It was simply a room. Leah saw that their bags had been taken downstairs to be loaded into the three coaches with three separate destinations. All but Julie's, which rested on her bed, to be taken down the hall to join some of the younger girls in their quarters. Leah did not want to leave, but by now she was almost gone already. And the school would never feel the same even if she stayed. Not without her friends, not with a man who she loved, who did not love her. Chapter 16 Walking downstairs, Leah had expected to see Talia, Julie and Agnes. She had expected to see the Duchess herself, ready to bid them farewell. She had not expected to see the Marquis, standing with them, talking and laughing as though nothing were wrong. Leah wasn't sure whether to be grateful he was there, or furious she had spent so much time looking for him, chasing him, only to find out he had been waiting by the door, talking and laughing with her friends the whole time. She chose to retain her composure, 
but as she walked up and everyone noticed her, the group fell silent. The Marquis stepped forward slightly nervously. All eyes were now on him. I have something to ask you, the Marquis said, his face flushing bright red. I have spoken with my mother, and she has said... He paused and looked over his shoulder at the women behind him, who were staring, some smiling, Talia giggling. Am I doing this properly? he asked. Talia put her hand over her mouth to stifle her giggles at the ridiculousness of a marquee asking them for advice on etiquette. Julie shrugged a little and shook her head, blushing. Agnes shook her head and sighed. On one knee, she said flatly, a faint smile forcing itself through her usual serene face. As Agnes said this, Leah suddenly realised what was about to happen, but as it did, it felt surreal nonetheless. Would you like to be my wife? the Marquis asked. Leah felt as though her heart was about to stop. I beg your pardon? I would like for you to marry me, the Marquis insisted, looking up at her with nothing but love in his eyes. It was a shock to her, after all she had assumed. She could scarcely believe he even liked her, let alone that he still loved her and wanted to marry her. Leah looked over to the Duchess. Your Grace, did Lord Salisbury just say that he has Your Grace's permission to wed me? Of course he has, she replied. But, Your Grace, I do not understand. How could you approve such an unequal marriage? Leah shook her head. You are a young lady of fair breeding and he is not exactly wanting for money nor for prestige, the Duchess replied in a matter-of-fact tone. It does not matter to me what you have now, but that you are a fine young lady with a noble background, which you have proven to me time and time again during your education here. And besides, I do believe he loves you. Leah looked back down at the handsome young Marquis, on one knee before her, as he reached out and took her hand softly in his, pressing her delicate fingers to his lips. Please do not break my heart, he insisted. After all this, please do not say that you do not wish to marry me. I do. I do wish to marry you, Leah said, her face flushing hotly, her heart beating so hard and fast her chest felt about to burst. I want it more than I have ever wanted anything in my entire life. I am simply so overwhelmed and so confused and... The Marquis stood up and embraced her softly. She seized up realising that he was doing so in front of four other people. And yet, looking over his shoulder at them, she saw no anger at his sudden display of affection. Even Agnes, who was normally so proper, simply smiled back at Leah. Leah sighed and wrapped her arms around the Marquis, feeling his heart beating hard against her body, the warmth of him permeating her. But what of my client? Leah asked suddenly, pushing away from the Marquis and looking to the Duchess. I am not sure the Duke of Lancaster will be too pleased that the governess he awaits will not be there for him. He needs someone immediately. The Duchess pursed her lips and furrowed her brow in contemplation. That is a problem indeed. I had not considered this when I agreed to your union. If necessary, Your Grace, I shall gladly become a governess for them, even if for a few weeks until they have someone else, Leah said. The Duchess shook her head. I hope it shall not be necessary. There are plenty of young women being educated here. I am sure one of the older girls would do. Your Grace, forgive me for interrupting, but I can go, Julie piped up. I would very much like to see some more of the world and put my new skills to good use. The Duchess hesitated again before nodding. Of course, Miss Lily, that is a splendid idea. I shall send for your bags and before long the coach shall be prepared for you. Do not feel you have to go for my sake, Leah said to Julie. If you are unprepared, you may wait. Someone else can go. No, it has been decided, Miss Drew, the Duchess insisted. Miss Lily ought to go and dress for her journey, as I do not believe she ought to travel such a distance in her house clothes. Leah felt a little surprised by the harshness of the Duchess's response. Was Julie not the girl who had been deemed wholly unprepared for life as a governess, whose understanding of etiquette was sorely lacking? But the Duchess would not have agreed to send Julie if she believed the girl was not ready for that role. 
Leah smiled and embraced Julie. Julie wrapped her arms around Leah as well. I shall be perfectly all right, Julie insisted. I am sure I shall be able to handle myself just fine. Do not worry. And if I have any trouble, I will not hesitate to contact you or Her Grace to find out what I ought to do. The Duchess looked at her watch and tutted a little. I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but it is about time that Miss Hubbard and Miss Smith ought to depart. Talia froze on the spot, still staring at Julie after an interaction that must have turned her world upside down. Looks like it is time for me to go, Julie, she said. All but leaping from Leah's arms, Julie embraced Talia tearfully. I shall miss you so very much. You have been a sister to me. And you also, Agnes. And you, Leah. I cannot wait to set off. And yet I shall miss you all so much. Talia hugged Julie tightly. You will always be my dear little sister, and I shall write to the Duke and Duchess of Lancaster's home as soon as I arrive, to make sure that you get my letter before anything else happens. With more tears and tight hugs, Agnes and Talia departed, and Julie set off upstairs to get changed as the coach was loaded with her belongings. As the carriages rolled away, Leah felt a deep pain, and a tear rolled down her cheek. She was happy for her friends, but it was the end of an era, so to speak. But now it felt much easier, much better. She could live with this era ending, because now she was not setting off into the vast unknown without a friend in sight. Now she was going to stay and spend the rest of her life with the most perfect man she had ever known. He took her hand in his and squeezed it lightly. She looked up into his eyes and smiled. The Duchess coughed to draw their attention back to her and slightly more pressing matters. I suggest that you compose a letter explaining your change in circumstances to the Duke of Lancaster, the Duchess said. I shall also write him. Leah nodded. Of course, Your Grace, I shall attend to that immediately. No need for too much detail, Miss Drew. A few lines explaining that you are unexpectedly engaged ought to suffice she explained before turning about and walking towards her office, presumably to compose her own letter. As the Duchess left, Leah realised how in awe she was of this amazing woman. Here was a woman who balanced the fineness of being a true lady with the seriousness of managing her own school and charity. A woman who looked after her son and yet gave him the freedom to make important choices. A woman who cared for each and every girl under her roof. Perhaps someday, if she was fortunate, Leah could be as much of a woman as the Duchess of Dorset. Realising she had been left alone with the Marquis, Leah suddenly felt a little embarrassed. I had not expected a marriage proposal. I thought my lord was avoiding my company. Why would I ever avoid your company, my dear? The Marquis asked back. Leah smiled. Well, what does my lord suppose it looked like? when every time I was seeking him he would run away and was never anywhere I could find him. I thought about what you had said, and I had the most fantastical idea, he explained. I did not believe it would work. So I was making some notes, then looking for my mother. You said, after all, that our relationship was wholly inappropriate unless we were married, did you not? So I wondered why we could not marry. Of course, I needed to consult with my mother first make sure that she and my father would not be against such a union. But why did you not tell me as soon as you found out? Leah asked. In a sense I did, the Marquis replied. My mother was so busy with your departure I could not find her, and I could not bear to see you before I had the news. My lord could have told me nonetheless, Leah replied, smiling and blushing some more. I feel quite the fool for not trusting in your good judgment. Well, you were indeed a fool for not trusting me. But I forgive you nonetheless, he insisted. After all, what sort of a terrible husband would I make if I were to begin holding grudges already? Leah laughed a little. That would indeed be most terrible, my lord. Now will I need to continue receiving enunciation lessons? she asked. Why, of course, every day in the afternoon. Though I would rather carry them out in a hammock in the garden. Much more pleasant out there, don't you think? Sunlight, the flowers, little birds and butterflies all around us. 
perhaps even a glass of port. Does that not sound much better than the stuffy little library? The Marquis said softly. Leah squeezed his hand, feeling how strong it was and how much smaller her own hand felt in comparison. Yes, it sounds lovely, my lord. Just one last little thing, he remarked with a grin. Leah looked up into his eyes. They twinkled with love and joy. What might that be, my lord? she asked. You shall have to call me by my name from now on, Leah, he replied, leaning in and brushing his lips gently against hers. Leah felt her heart beating harder and harder. Of course, James, she whispered back before closing the kiss. Chapter 17 Leah could not contain her excitement as a maid combed her hair. The day had finally arrived. But she was not just excited about her wedding. A wedding may be a once-in-a-lifetime occasion, of course, but the marriage was the true charm of the whole affair. No, the most exciting part to Leah was that she would finally, after months of waiting, see her closest and dearest friends. And she had missed them so very much. As her hair was done up and gently decorated with flowers, a maid came to announce that her guests had finally arrived. The door was opened, and her friends practically burst in, ready to see her on her big day. Julie embraced Leah closely. She looked so much older already, a fully grown woman. Leah was at once impressed and saddened to see the youngest of the group looking so grown up already. At least she still had that affectionate nature they had all loved so much in her. Talia was very much her usual self, with a positivity that radiated from her. She was much better dressed than she had been for a while. It seemed that she had not been exaggerating when she said that Agnes had motivated her to better herself and be more feminine and ladylike. She had applied all she had learned and she looked wonderful and moved with even more grace than Leah thought Talia could muster. Agnes had something about her that seemed very much different. There was a warmth, a softness to her that Leah had never seen before. It was as though her harsh exterior had been cracked, letting a little of her more delicate soul shine through. You seem so calm for a woman on her wedding day, Talia exclaimed. Leah smiled. I have had some time to prepare. Truth be told, she was overwhelmed with excitement. This was the day she had been waiting for, but it felt as though it had come far too soon. Leah knew she was ready, but she didn't quite feel ready yet. There was a difference between being ready and feeling it. Are you ready? Agnes asked. Leah nodded. I am. Come, you may join me in my carriage to the church. The drive down was pure excitement as the women discussed their lives since they parted ways, their employers and their hopes and dreams. Leah had not anticipated so much change in so little time. It was no wonder that her friends seemed so much more mature, more complete, since she had last seen them. Everything in their lives was radically different to before, and all of the young women had been forced to adapt to their new lives by growing as people. Talia, incredibly, was working for a family that had seven children, of which five were girls. Only someone with her energy could possibly keep up with five young girls to educate. She explained how Lord and Lady Elridge were much older people, who had started their family quite old in the first place, and had their youngest only a year ago, even though both were now in their fifties and did not have the energy to run after a toddler. Talia was working hard, not only to make sure all the children were properly cared for, but to make sure that the five girls were raised to be good, respectable young women with plenty of marriage prospects. Apparently they were quite the handful, and Talia herself rarely got out, but she still retained some hope of marrying some day. Julie found the Duke and Duchess of Lancaster to be firm but fair, and their daughter to be an absolute delight. After a few weeks with them, she completely understood the Duchess of Devon's choice to send her there. Julie and the daughter had much in common, and both were learning from one another. It was much less of a governess situation, and much more as though the Duke and Duchess had adopted Julie, taking her under their wing to ensure she got a proper start in life as she deserved. Leah was glad that her friend had found so much love and support in her new home, whatever the official arrangement was. 
Only Agnes again did not say much about her life, work or her employer. Proper as always, she simply stated it was private. Leah knew she was living in Portsmouth, as that was the post office Agnes asked to have her letters sent to. But besides that, it was a mystery to them all. Arriving at the church, they once again parted ways, as Leah took in all the beautiful flowers decorating the doors and steps. She had not been involved in hanging them out, and now that she finally saw them, she was taken aback by their stunning beauty. White and pink roses everywhere, cut from the greenhouses at the school, carefully folded into wreaths and hearts, hanging from every available surface. Walking in was a daunting sensation. She would walk in a single girl and come out a married woman. Her own transformation was still in process, but it had to take place. She walked in through the great doors. All alone again, at the rear of the church, Leah felt a pang of pain. Normally it would be a father's duty to give away his daughter, but he was not there. She did not even have a mother, an uncle, or a grandparent to give her away. Nobody could give her away but herself, because she belonged to nobody but herself. Nobody lay claim to her. Nobody took her in. Nobody would consider her theirs. Except, of course, the man who was about to claim her entirely for his own. And it was not the same. She would have given anything for her father to be there by her side as she approached the man who would in mere minutes become her husband. But she would walk that aisle with pride. She was a strong, good woman and a good person. Holding her head high, she walked up to the door. It was somewhat awkward, walking down the aisle on her own. She knew people would be staring, especially the few from the Marquise's side, who did not know the details of her circumstances. Looking up towards the altar, she felt her heart melt. The Marquis looked so handsome as he stood waiting for her. Leah felt her confidence soar. He did not care about these things, about her past and her troubles. He did not care that she did not have a father to give her away, or that she had no money to give him as a dowry. And if he did not care, why should anyone else? Standing at the altar, listening to the priest reading their rites, it all became real. The minutes were counting down, and soon she would be Lady Salisbury. It was like waking up from a pleasant dream, only to find out it was entirely real. Do you take this woman to be your lawfully wedded wife? the priest asked. I do, the Marquis replied, gazing at Leah with pure love. And do you take this man to be your lawfully wedded husband? the priest asked, turning to Leah. She gazed at James. He was so incredibly handsome and perfect. I do, she said softly as he leaned in, seizing her hand. Their lips locked. She felt so giddy with happiness she could have fainted. As he drew back, she could hear the guests in the pews applauding. It did not matter what they thought of her. All that mattered was her friends, in the front row, who supported her, and the man, stood by her side, who was taking her for his wife. She no longer feared the judging eyes of the crowd. In fact, now she dearly wanted to see exactly who had been invited, who had actually come to attend their wedding in the end. Gripping her husband's hand, she turned to face the church. Looking out across the room, Leah felt proud. There were not too many people, but the ones who were present were those who counted. The people who had loved and supported her through it all. She didn't need to see anyone else out there. Epilogue. Leah collapsed back in her chair in a most undignified manner. Her belly was getting a bit too big for gracefulness, though. After all, at seven and a half months pregnant, Anything resembling a sense of balance had gone. Her feet felt like they were made of lead, and being largely front-heavy was making life rather difficult. She was surprised to find James saying how much he loved her and how beautiful he found her, even in this state. She certainly didn't feel lovable and beautiful, though she was very much glad he was apparently blind to her ballooned body. She glanced at the envelope he had handed her while sorting his post, immediately recognising that immaculate handwriting, then cutting the seal with her letter knife. As she did, James finished sorting his own post and left it on the cabinet, walking up to Leah's chair. Who is it from, my love? James asked, 
leaning over her and kissing the top of her head gently. Anything exciting to tell me? It is from Agnes, Leah replied, beginning to read the letter. And it says we are invited to her wedding. Agnes? The Marquis seemed surprised. I would not have guessed she would be the next to marry, I must be honest with you. She just seemed... I know, Leah replied. It's taken me by surprise as well. Who is the unfortunate soul marrying stern little Agnes, then? He asked. Leah shook her head. She does not say. This is not a formal invitation. She is simply warning us that in a few weeks we will receive an invitation. So she took her time to write you a letter, to make sure you know you shall receive another letter soon, he asked. Sounds very much like something my mother would do. And if both Agnes and your mother do it, my love, then it is probably the correct thing to do, Leah replied. James laughed. That is most true. I do wonder what sort of a man would choose Agnes, though. I am excited to learn more about him, Leah said with a soft smile. I am sure that he is a wonderful man and perfect for her. She struck me as a little demanding, the Marquis insisted. I am not sure she would ever have a man who would have her. I do not mean anything by this, of course. But she seemed the type who would never believe a man to be perfect enough for her. Oh no, I understand you perfectly, my love. And if I know Agnes at all, then she would never settle for anyone less than perfect for her, Leah insisted. I wonder when the wedding shall be. Does it say? He asked, peering over her shoulder again. Leah shook her head. Not as far as I can tell. Just tells us to wait for our invitation. I hope you are not too pregnant to travel by then, James said, gently caressing her round belly. I shall make provisions for a long, steady journey there. Where is it again? Portsmouth, Leah replied. Apparently she has been employed by the Duke of Portsmouth this whole time. And yet not a word to any of us, of course. Her business, not anyone else's. Leah laughed a little. I did not know he had a daughter, the Marquis replied. I suppose that may explain the secrecy, if she is raising some secret child. Now, now, let's not be hasty, Leah replied. We have more important things to focus on than gossip, such as this child. She rubbed her belly gently, feeling a little foot kicking hard against her hand. That sounds most excellent, he said. His eyes were glowing with love for his wife and his unborn child. Do you wish to go for a nice walk again today? Or is it more of a restful day? I think I would like to rest with you, my love, she replied. Leah pressed her lips softly to his, feeling his hands caress her face and hair. Her hair cascaded down over her shoulders as he undid the clasp, running his fingers through her brown locks gently and lovingly. She sighed. She could not have wished for more. Click on the link in the first comment or scan the QR code to read the next book. Click on the link in the description to read the next book in the series. Share this video with your friend or watch on of the following videos. Subscribe to our channel, like this video, and hit the notification bell to not miss any new audiobooks. Thank you for watching.